I have the honor and privilege to welcome Sanita Bayar on the stage. Sanita is the chairwoman of Finance Latvia Association, the organizers of this event. And Sanita, being the state secretary of the Ministry of Finance, you have played instrumental role in introducing Euro in Latvia. You have also served as alternate executive director at the World Bank. Did you know that uh, Sanita has excellent education, uh, uh, not only in finance economy, cum laude, by the way, but did you know that she has also a medical degree from Latvian Medical Academy with honors, cum laude. Welcome Sanita Bayare with a round of applause for her introductory remarks. Thank you, Maris, for so kind words. Uh, dear distinguished excellences, financial industry experts, discussion participants and attendees, welcome to the Finance Latvia Association conference from grey to green. Latvia's success story. We are living in challenging times of collective development, where technological progress and economic growth are mixed with distressing events, such as the war in Ukraine, the pandemics and ecological disasters. Many in society are only now beginning to understand and consider sustainability issues, which are inseparable from social responsibility, good governance and integrity. The financial sector has encountered these issues sooner than others and has acted accordingly. Latvia is no exception. Also, we all needed a push which finally came. As a result, we have achieved fundamental changes that have made Latvia's money uh, laundering prevention system one of the best in Europe, as Prime Minister just said. Our public-private partnership ensures efficient and effective cooperation at the strategic and operational level, and I'm happy that representatives from FIU also participate in, in this conference and will give their thoughts and insights later today. Latvia has implemented several new solutions which the international community views as a good example. We ensure development of an, in, uh, of an adequate national risk assessment system, which is waterfall in internal control systems of private businesses. We also have legally correct and generally available register of ultimate beneficial owners, and presentation about this also will follow. This is a very important and effective tool, uh, how we implement sanctions, and it, was, uh, it, it really earned international command. From today's perspective, this work has paid off for us several times over. Opting out of unmanageable risks and, and transitioning to better risk-aligned risk management has allowed Latvian banks to react quickly to the introduction of sanctions against Russia and Belarus, make well sought out decisions and, and cooperate smoothly with state institutions and their customers. It has also made it impossible for dishonest persons or even criminals to influence processes taking place in our country, thereby reducing a significant threat to the global financial system and the security of each individual at the whole country. We are looking forward with confidence and certainty. An important task is to restore Latvia's reputation and keep it intact at international level, and I hope this conference will help it. The Latvian banking sector will continue to look for the most effective ways to provide inclusive financial services to uh, sound customers, thus also ensuring the achievement of sustainability goals. In today's conference, we will take a brief look back at the past to generate ideas for the future. I hope that the insights and opinions gained during the conference will help us achieve that goal. 
Finally, I want to express my sincere gratitude to our organizers who have made this conference possible. Your support and commitment to sustainability and essential, are essential uh, to our collective efforts to create a better future for ourselves and for generations to come. Thank you very much and enjoy the conference. Thank you very much, Ms. Sanit Bayare. What a fantastic way to celebrate the 30 years of the association. Now, I would like to invite on the stage Mr. Sébastien de Brouwer, Chief Policy Officer at the European Banking Federation. Meet Sébastien with applause. I have to, I have to mention Sebastian, you are a, a great lawyer, you know, the ambassador of the legal profession. So, uh, and therefore, I, I get it. So, you joined EBF in 2006, and you played a key role in shaping the EU legal acts in the finance and banking field for the last 17 years, particularly in the AML area. Sebastian, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Mary. Thank you for those uh, kind words. And, and, and by the way, also thank you for pronouncing my, my name so well. I know it's not easy. Um, um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, there's Sanita. It's, it's really a pleasure to be, uh, to be with you um, today. And I'd like to, of course, express my, my gratitude to, um, to you and to Finance Latia for um, inviting us to, to participate in this remarkable uh, conference. I think the setup and the, uh, the organization of this event is, is truly uh, impressive. And I think it's reflect actually the level of, um, of success we are celebrating uh, today. Because I can say it even perhaps more than uh, you can do it. We are indeed celebrating a success story. Or to use a more topical term, uh, a, a successful transition. I recall actually being in uh, uh, 2018 in, in Latvia. In, um, I think it, I was sitting in the office of your predecessor, uh, Sanda Lepina, and it was indeed a um, difficult time for the Latvian banking sector and, and for Latvia um, as a whole, as a country. And we were at the time exchanging uh, best practices in, in other EU uh, countries. I think the association was still known at the time as the Association of Latvia uh, Commercial Banks, which uh, subsequently transformed into uh, Finance uh, Latvia. So it was indeed a challenging period following the, uh, the collapse of the uh, ABLV Bank, uh, which, if I recall correctly, was uh, Latvia a third largest uh, bank. So this was not only a failure, I believe, for Latvia, but it was also a failure for Europe, as it exposed a significant gap in the banking supervision architecture established by the EU institution following the, uh, the financial crisis. And as you know, this event, together with uh, other scandals across Europe, triggered a complete review of the uh, anti-money laundering rulebook and the uh, supervisory architecture at, at European level. And this is still ongoing with the uh, trilogue uh, of the so-called IML package set to start in Brussels in a few days. But Lav Latvia reacted swiftly and adequately. ABLV bank membership uh, in, in finance Latvia was immediately terminated, but and even much more importantly, I think Latvia, with the involvement of all experts, institution, and organization, implemented significant reforms with a full overall of the supervision of its financial sector to strengthen its ability to combat money laundering, terrorist financing, and proliferation uh, financing. These efforts saved Latvia uh, from being placed on the international grey list of high-risk money laundering countries, um, which would, of course, have had a very damaging effect on the banking system and the, uh, the national economy. 
And actually, these efforts made much more. They made Latvia a reference model for the rest of Europe in the fight against money laundering. Latvia has indeed among the highest standards and perhaps equally important, it has facilitated innovation in the AML field without being disproportionately concerned about data protection rules. And in the current debate, as you perhaps know, there is a very restrictive interpretation of what banks can do in terms of inf information sharing. Most data protection authorities interpret the GDPR in a way that significantly limits information sharing and reduces the efficiency of the system. It's a notorious killer. This is fortunately not the case in Latvia. Now, we'll not list all the innovation um, in, in Latvia in, in the fight against money laundering, but highly efficient shared KYC utility, um, best in class information tools, as I just mentioned, which are indeed critical to uh, the success in AML, and both between, I mean, the private sector, so obliged entities, but also uh, private or public-private uh, partnership, including on more operational information. A PEP database, a best-in-class class UBO register, with all the necessary process in place to ensure accuracy, including enforcement measures and sanctions. Those are actually kinds of tools many compliance officers from other EU countries are dreaming of uh, having. And there is still so much uh, that the rest of Europe can learn from Latvia. Now, at the EU level, we view the uh, IML package as an opportunity uh, for the uh, EU to fundamentally enhance the effectiveness of its IML framework. Now, as I said, the elephant in the room is information exchange and the interaction between IML and the GDPR. We're extremely concerned that the system will remain rigid and not improve in efficiency, as highlighted in the recent letter, interpretation letter from the European Data Protection Board. We hope still that a co-legislator will look at the Latvian reference model uh, for better solution. So about Latvia, from zero to hero, as a Latvian expert in, in AML put it. And that's what we are celebrating today. However, it doesn't mean that Latvia should stop, of course. Today, we'll see how the AML policy, which is one of the essential societal contributions of banks, contribute to the uh, ESG goals. The system must continue to evolve in light of the continuous evolution of criminals in all types of financial crimes. Other ESG elements, such as environmental, social, with inclusion, diversity, and good governance criteria are crucial today and will become even more critical in the future to maintain the reputation and the attractiveness of a financial sector and to maintain the attractiveness of investment in a country. So it's great to see that ESG is high on the Latvian agenda. This is a topic of today, from grey to green. And I would like to end with two additional considerations. Firstly, I think it's good to celebrate success as it serves uh, as motivation for, for others. We quite often hear you know, bad stories, bad news. Here we celebrate a success. And not only it serves as motivation for others, but also it encourages the dissemination of good practices. And secondly, I strongly believe that the Latvian case demonstrates that with willingness, ambition, and cooperation, so by working together and trusting each other, we can achieve great things. Because I believe that the success uh, of Latvia is truly a joint effort by many, and this is, of course, crucial in the fight against financial crime. Thank you, and let me also wish again a happy birthday to uh, Finance Latvia. Thank you very much. We have all heard a lot about ESG and sustainability, and definitely a lot about AML. 
But now it's like an idea leadership to really understand and discuss how these two fit together. Do they fit together? Is AML uh, just a concept under the good governance? Whether by saying ESG we will now understand also AML, sanctions, compliance, all of that. I think, you know, we are on the same um, like starting point in, in Europe, even in the world on that discussion. And therefore, what you need to bring it forward, idea leaders. And I would like to welcome on the stage the moderator of the discussion, Zlata Elksninger, alongside the great panelists. Now, I have the honor knowing you, Zlata, for many, many years. Um, I serve uh, together with you in Foreign Investors Council. So Zlata knows uh, what the businesses would like to see. And basically, uh, Zlata, I do not know where you get the energy from. You are also, uh, yes, you are also a great partner in PricewaterhouseCoopers. And I know that, Zlata, uh, you like to explore different cultures, right? You like to travel. I believe you also like to develop new ideas. And I wish you a lot of success on this wonderful panel where we will have Mr. Mikhail Kozlovs, member of the European Court of Auditors, Dean of Chamber 4. That sounds serious, the Chamber 4. <laughs> chamber 4 is the best. Yes. We have Eva Tetere, CEO at SCB Bank, chairperson of the Finance Latvia Association's Council. And we have Kristine Czernaya Mežmale, the member of the Council of Latvia's Banka, the regulator. <laughs> so, Zlata, the floor is yours alongside your fantastic panelists. I think Maris did half of my job. Yeah, <laughs> I probably need to leave right now, but uh, uh, yes, colleagues, I think um, we are here to talk and to start, the pan uh, to start the conversation about two relevant topics. One is how can we learn what we got out of the IML processes altogether in our way to sustainability. And I'm very proud today hearing that Latvia is the best in class. And I could say internationally it is really so. There are a lot of learnings which are coming with the process. And the road was not very simple. It was a bumpy road. We have seen uh, how much it required from both the regulator, from banks, from the society as a whole to accept, to understand and actually move forward. And today we will be talking about what are the lessons, what are the similarities in the concept of ESG and IML, how we could bring those lessons forward and what are our opportunities. And then, with further ado, let me start with the first question. So, how does the IML relate to ESG and what are the similar challenges in the road to sustainability? Michael. Yes, uh, thank you, Zlata, and also thanks to the Finance Latvia Association and to Sanita for the invitation. It is really my pleasure to be here together with uh, experienced colleagues. First of all, a couple of words about the uh, European Court of Audit as an external auditor of, of the European Union. We look at uh, the effectiveness of the EU policies and the EU spending, including uh, the AML policy and uh, various uh, ESG policies. Uh, and in, in that context, uh, just to remind, in 2021, shortly before the Commission published its package of new proposals, we published our report on the efficiency of the AML um, system in the EU, which is still relevant in my view, so I advise everyone to look at it. And also we have a suite of reports, really a lot of reports on uh, um, uh, environmental, social and governance aspects of uh, the EU policy and EU spending. Um, 
I think in the field of both AML and ESG, we need to keep the momentum. Um, before 2021, uh, we all uh, witnessed various major scandals in the EU banking system. Um, and now almost two years on, and I'm a little bit disappointed that two years uh, you know, have passed without yet a, a, a final agreement. Uh, between uh, the, the European Council and the European Parliament. Uh, on, the, on the other hand, I am, uh, I'm, I'm encouraged to see that uh, the European Parliament has come up with its position in March, very recently in March this year. And I'm also uh, glad to see that in you know, this time around, uh, both institutions, but especially the European Parliament, is very ambitious in terms of um, uh, investing more EU powers into this challenging area of, of the IML. And uh, similarly, in the field of ESG, I think uh, the European Union is, uh, is a leader, is in a leadership position as, as far as sustainable policies are concerned. Uh, and I think also not only uh, in climate change, but also in um, uh, actually reporting. We, we know both banking sector and also uh, big companies will have to do much more detailed reporting on the ESG uh, already, I think, uh, next next year. Uh, on the other hand, we, we always uh, hear the reminders that the business is not done yet. Uh, we face uh, still various uh, scandals, revelations in the EU banking sector of major financial institutions. Uh, and the war in the Ukraine, last but not the least, of course, uh, complicates uh, the picture even, uh, even further. Um, you asked me a question about uh, similarities between AML and ESG. I think there are some. I, I, will, I will mention uh, uh, some of them, and I think we will explore this in our, uh, in our conversations. Uh, although, first of all, you might ask a question, what's, what's there in common? Not, not so much. Uh, on the other hand, I think there is more in common than it seems from the first sight. Uh, and I think that uh, when uh, AML and ESG framework actually work together, work in sync, so to say, uh, we, as the European Union, enhance uh, our reputation as a, as a place for secure and sustainable investment. I think this is key. And uh, just to give an example, the potential here is indeed huge. According to the latest estimates of the European Investment Bank, um, uh, the EU needs 350 billion in investment per year uh, to achieve the climate goals for 2030. And I think uh, to go to the net zero, we need even, even more until, uh, until 2050. So I think uh, there, is, there is a good potential and there is a need to look at them uh, uh, together. So maybe I will stop here. I have some more examples, but maybe I will come in, in the debate. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Michael, Christine, yeah. what is your take? Yeah, thank you. And uh, it is my pleasure to be here today and uh, be part of this panel. And uh, here in this hall, we are all the parts of our success story of Latvia, both the regulatory framework, the uh, enforcement agencies, the government agencies, the banks, the financial sector. We have been working crazy to achieve the results where we are today. And it should never stop uh, to avoid the situation where we were in 2018, going through the uh, AOM money wall assessment, FATF assessment. It was a hard job for, for everybody. And my suggestion is not to go that direction, but to be proactive going forward with the ESG aspects. So it is like a controversial topic to speak about what is common with AML and ESG. And I would say that I think there are many things in common. And the first thing, which is like the the most vivid one is the governance, the tone from the top, how the internal control systems are established in the institution. This is in the core or in the DNS of financial supervisors to look after how the banks are implementing the risk management systems, how they are assessing the risks, how they are identifying the weak points, and what kind of mitigation actions they are putting in place. So this goes for all risk types. It doesn't matter how we call it. Either it is AML, ESG, credit risk, market risk, interest rate risk, the same procedures for everybody. Of course, the difficulty lies within the data. The difficulty lies with unclear and unclear regulatory framework, which is still in the coming. But to avoid any kind of delayed action, my personal opinion is we need to act now. We need to identify the weak points and the strengths in our financial system in Latvia. 
Thank you very much. And uh, Eva, from the you know pure banking perspective, you are really hands on on all of these processes. Yeah. Hello to everybody. Really honored to be here and uh, be in this first panel. Um, of course, uh, I'm probably more practical and more professional, but I fully agree with uh, everything what has been mentioned. What I wanted to add is that uh, if we look uh, on similarities, AML and ESG, I think um, from the broader perspective, the aim of both initiatives is the same. We all want to make our world a better place to live today, better place to live for next generations. In one way, I think uh, we can fill in AML questionnaires and we can uh, look on the sanction list, but we should not forget the aim, the essence of it. It is to make the world a better place, uh, to exclude those which are really involved in different types of uh, money laundering and crime. And the same about ESG. We are really aiming to make the place better not just to collect data or calculate CO2s. Uh, the other thing is when I'm thinking about both of those things, I feel that um, in both cases, we are thinking that the old models, old uh, ways how we are organized, doesn't help us to get to the next level. In our economy, in our businesses, we can't, uh, can't operate in the same way because then our businesses are not sustainable. So I think, yeah, both we should take also very broad perspective, very broad concept that we are not alone. When we talk about AML and KYC, we probably were hit the most because we are closer to the East uh, countries. Uh, when we uh, think about ESG and climate, we feel that our climate is not so much affected. But we should not forget that the whole world is so united, so we can't ignore what is happening maybe in um, uh, continents more south, because it will affect us. Whatever we do, uh, we are part of the global world, and the global world is very, very much connected. So that's my take, um, to so make the, the world better for next generations. Just uh, while Eva was speaking, it just popped into my mind that the common similarity, like which is like the most outspoken, is transparency and accountability, both for the ESG and AML. So the both aspects are really looking through the ethical, works, of ethical ways of working, and this is for the global sustainable growth. So it is a global trend. Uh, both are very globally aligned. The standards are quite uh, understandable in the global arena, and that is important that we are acting now, even though we might consider each individually that we are living in a nice place. So this is not touching us. So if I am not a criminal by day, I, I might be criminal by night. So I should be very careful. So we don't know actually how that might impact the Latvian society, our financial sector, and criminals. Are you the ones who are trying always to be ahead of time? And and, and they know exactly how to avoid any system. So we, be, we need to be first in class. Yeah, and I think uh, FATF had issued the, uh, the paper where they have uh, sort of calculated what is uh, the revenues from the illegal uh, environmental activities which are gained. And it's huge. And I think in terms of all of these numbers, I think it's even more um, sort of important to be, uh, to be part of it. The next qu question round, we have heard what are the similarities, is what are the lessons which we learned from really making uh, the IML process to work for Latvia, uh, which we need to bring right now to our road to sustainability. And uh, I mean, I know that there is a lot of similarities we have talked about, but there probably are some specific things which need to be done by both of the regulator and the institu financial institution themselves to bring it. And moreover, financial institutions right now are the drivers of the change of the sustainability. So there is a lot of pressure on that. Christine, maybe we could start with you. So this is one of the most asked questions I always answer. Uh, 
whether we are going in direction of AML over regulating everything, uh, what are the lessons learned, what we do, what we, do, what, we sh what we should do differently. And the main thing what we should do differently is act now, not sleep, not wait for some kind of wonders happening, to really follow the global trends, to follow the emerging risks what are happening around the globe and really act now and start with the small steps. If you are really beginning uh, in this area like the ESG, start with the governance, start with the education, start with the proper uh, addressing the resources, putting pla in place people who are really dealing with this stuff. I see really that the most successful financial institutions across the Europe are the ones which are putting effort efforts in the governance area and dedicating sufficient resources for the important topics which are uh, like very vocal around the globe. Really not to wait, I think that is the biggest uh, lesson what we could do, otherwise we end up in the situation what we were in with the AML, that we need to turn the ship very rapidly in stormy waters, the ship is starting to like bounce around, it is very hard to stabilize it. and. Uh, it's better to act slowly, but to act now while the regulation is still in development. Yeah, I think we have a, a lot of the sentiment of, you know, last minute decision, which probably not very effective uh, in any case. Uh, how to find this proper balance between sort of going into being fast and making decision, but uh, making the right decision and the right cho cho choice? Because ESG and IML, it is something which will stay yeah, for a much longer time than we could predict. And definitely the sustainability is something which is long-term process. Eva, what is your take on that? So uh, maybe lessons learned and takeaways as uh, we are discussing uh, now. Uh, I think first, I will have three of them. <laughs> first, uh, really calibrate the size of the process and uh, situation. And if I'm looking back to AML and KYC, how we approached, and now I'm talking uh, more about SEB as my experience comes there. So uh, looking back maybe how far we can go, year 2014 when we started to talk much more urgently about AML topics than previously, um, I think that we didn't assess the seriousness of the topic and we started with very small um, units, small steps, small tasks. Uh, and only afterwards, looking now backwards in my uh, uh, backwards mirror, I can say that it was uh, our mistake. So we probably needed to assess that this topic will be much more serious and much more broader today. In SCB Baltics, uh, we have calculated that we have approximately 10% of people working on compliance, AML, KYC area. And I think this is something we have to learn from that experience that also ESG um, needs to be assessed how broad it is. And then we can start with the smaller steps, but this perspective and calibration of the topic needs to be done now, as Christina said, act now. Um, of course, then there is transition period and, and maybe transition can be slower or faster, but at least we have, we have to build this vision, what we want to achieve, and then we can start implementation. The other lesson, which from very practical perspective, but I think that you will all agree with me, uh, whenever such transformation journey starts, we have to take more um, people with us on the on the ship, on the boat, and for example, customers. I think with AML, KYC, what we did, excellent journey, but it was very much inwards looking. The regulators, the financial institutions, we, um, enforcement institutions, everybody, we connected, we made working groups, we connected with the government, so we, we stood very strong. But when we faced our customers, they were not there. They were upset. They were not uh, understanding why exactly we are asking these questions. What will follow? What, why do we act this way? So I think now when we think about ESG, as 
early as we can engage customers in the process, it will help us. So if we can start engaging them now to be part of our change, it definitely will make a huge benef benefit for uh, everybody. And then I think uh, what also Christina mentioned is governance learning. Yeah, How do we do? Do we start from the bottom up? Do we start from the top down? And I'm a believer from uh, lessons learned AML area that we have to start from top down uh, because we have to show the, and demonstrate the importance of the topic from the very, very top of organizations. SCB, uh, I think, excellent example. Uh, within SCB group, we talk uh, in sustainability very, very long time ago. Our first green bonds were issued in, I think, 2008, if I'm not mistaken. So it has been already a long journey. But when I think about this calibration, what SCB uh, has done now, um, our CEO has introduced even a separate um, uh, supervisory, uh, supervisory Council or Advisory Council. So external experts uh, in uh, climate and uh, ESG areas like consultants, professors, are helping SEB group to understand where the world is driving, what are the next trends, how can we help our customers. And therefore, I really feel that this is a tone from the top. So we have invested at the very top of the organization saying, hey, this is our strategy. We want to be pioneers. We invest in a separate independent board. We look how we can uh, help our customers together with professors, with experts, etc. So I think this is also the learning when it was in 2014, 2015, we talked about AML. I think it was very much bottom up because people understood what the regulators are after, but it was very difficult to knock to the very top and say, we need more resources. Hello, we need more resources. It was a very tough um, a conversation between the uh, vision from the top, uh, business vision, and uh, vision from the bottom, where it was much more regulatory uh, driven. So this time, I think we have taken the right path. Great. Um, I'm just wondering, from the regulator's perspective, uh, taking into account all these three bits, and actually, I think, uh, very much in terms of calibrating what we're doing and how we're doing, we have learned from IML that, you know, from rule-based approach, how to get into the uh, risk-based approach. Uh, Christine, how do you look uh, on this topic in terms of the ESG, IML, ESG, because they are so interlinked and uh, interrelated. So, so I would say that uh, this is still a road ahead. So, still the AML and the implementation of true risk-based approaches is quite a challenge. Uh, it is not only our story we see it uh, across the Europe, or even across the globe. So to really tackle the proper level of risk assessment is, is key in, in every aspect. For me, I have a confusion here in, uh, in, in this sense. I really don't understand how to assess the, the climate change with the risk-based approach. So I have a confusion with myself discussing this. So um, I, I don't have actually answer for that. So I still think you can implement some kind of proportionality according to the risks which the country you are working in are exposed to, but really whether you can uh, really say that, okay, this mining activity, uh, I know it's a small harm to the nature, I will, okay, finance it, whether that is something viable in the long term, I have no clear definition there for like a supervisory perspective. What we are doing now in a, in a, in a European supervisory bodies is really, uh, talk about the strategies, talk about risk management, talk about internal controls, the reporting, uh, the data collection, the building up the resources and the capability actually to work with those issues. And uh, yeah, the, the, the road is ahead, uh, the road is long, but we will manage that. Thank you.
Michal. Yes, uh, thank you. I would like probably uh, to pick up on uh, what you both said. I think you uh, both looked at a kind of national level, what's going on at, at the level of a particular institution uh, or, or financial institution. I, I think uh, I would like to underline the need for kind of uh, you know European approach here, because if uh, I remember in the AML field uh, we spoke about uh, the weakest link, yeah. Uh, and I think in that context, Latvia has done a remarkable job uh, actually to move out of this, uh, of, uh, this um, qualification. The same risk applies to the ESG, mm -hmm. uh, because, because if, if it's not the case, uh, the risk of moral hazard is very high. Yeah? So I think uh, European approach is important, and what we see from our work in various areas uh, in the financial uh, s sector is that exactly that's where we are still missing a little bit. Yeah, we, we, uh, in Europe, we set uh, the objectives high and uh, homogeneously, but what we miss is, is uh, at, the, at the implementation level. And here, the role of the, of the EU institutions, European Commission, European Central Bank is actually key uh, to make sure it works more or less homogeneously um, across the EU. And then the EU uh, would be able to uh, transmit uh, these standards beyond the EU borders. All right. Um, just uh, one fr from what I have heard uh, in relation to um, lessons learned and uh, what you all are mentioned about the operations is data is the key factor and assessing the risk is important. And uh, Christina, as you mentioned rightly, what are the risks and how to manage it? How do you believe we are prepared with the data uh, and how can we assess uh, the environmental risk based on the data which we possess currently and what should be done? Yeah, should I start? Yeah. Oh my God, the data, that is the, the big topic. So, but I like uh, one sentence uh, which I have heard in, in some of the discussions, let not make data to be enemy for the sustainable growth. So act with the data what we possess at the moment and think how we can create data what we need. Either it is like some kind of uh, technical solutions. Uh, for me, it, I think personally believe that aligned structure with data collection would be the most beneficial way how to tackle this. Uh, but I would say that data is the biggest challenge across the globe. So nobody has the, the cor correct data. We can use satellites, but they are not focused to the primary focus points, what we need to assess. Uh, there are so many data providers which are actually not really aligned with the standards. You cannot really sometimes rely on the quality of that. So there is uh, many, many challenges ahead. Uh, but I think if we could manage some kind of central data point, which could collect the, in, the data which will be collected uh, afterwards from the customers anyway, that would be beneficial. You mean national data? Yeah, some, something center. like yeah, national. Yeah. yeah. I was a bit uh, more reflecting on Christina's uh, challenge, uh, risk-based approach <laughs> towards ESG. <laughs> Uh, but I think that uh, ESG, as I said, it is so broad question and so many activities which we have to um, perform to achieve our targets and to achieve uh, Europe um, neutrality uh, that we have to start somehow risk-based approach. Otherwise, we will be lost in this uh, a big ocean immediately if we would uh, shoot everything. So uh, my suggestion would be really to assess in each of the financial institutions portfolio, which are the most critical industries, the most polluting, the most climate uh, uh, affecting industries and starting from the top names in your uh, portfolios really start from the risk based. So, for example, we have set our targets. We said that we are going to reduce brown. And, of course, we can't do it immediately saying, OK, we don't finance uh, any energy company in Latvia because uh, there is connection to gas or whatever. Of course, we can't do that. But we set our transition based on the risk. So we look which is the biggest pie which we can address immediately. And that's the one we address. And then we go uh, lower down the, down the list. And um, yeah, for us, we have said that this is uh, uh, energy, heating, transport, 
and of course uh, agriculture portfolio which we are looking at. So they are, these are the topic areas which should be prioritized yes, and the yes, others. Yes. Okay. So it, it should always be pragmatic. Like any any work we are doing, it should be pragmatic. It should be specific for the each individual institution for the country. Even the FATF standards are saying that uh, uh, in the AML area, you need to assess the risks according the risk that the country is facing. The same goes also for the ESG. Even though we are a country with like abundant natural resources, but our financial system might be abused for those bad actors trying to uh, do harmful activities to nature and use the financial system. And this is like the link uh, which should be Im embedded uh, within the, uh, the risk management system of, of, of financial institutions. And yeah. All right. So um, then going back to the EU level and the regulatory level, so what do you think from uh, the lessons learned from the past processes we went through and this, uh, you know, the big uh, investment that uh, European Union has done, the bank has done, the society has done as well, uh, um, what are the actions uh, which could uh, sort of be taken on the much higher level than just the uh, uh, Latvian regulatory level, uh, which could bring really a lot of impact to the change of the topic. Yes, well, uh, I think uh, uh, the main lessons learned, I think, is, is that uh, slowly but surely we have to move in the direction of the uh, so-called single rule book. Uh, single rule book. Uh, we have very good examples uh, there in terms of uh, supervision of financial sector, uh, resolution uh, of, you know, of uh, um, financial institutions in case of uh, difficulties. And I think now we move with uh, the latest package in the field of IML much closer to the concept of the single rule book. I, I, I hope the you know at this uh, final stage of negotiations the package will not be diluted. And I think also in the field of uh, ESG that probably should be the next uh, the next step, and it's already uh, being made. So I I think we should uh, we should learn um, the lessons from the AML field. Uh, not to repeat the same mistakes in the in the ESG field. The risks, of course, are high because when when I look at the most recent ECB report uh, about the um, the ability of the financial institutions, major EU financial institutions, to report on the environmental issues, uh, the readiness is still uh, not there. Although uh, it will become mandatory already next year, so I think there is still a, a relatively big gap to close. Uh, before the financial institutions, banks that are more advanced per se, uh, will be able uh, to report uh, on a qualitative level. And that's we come to the question of data. I think uh, w there is potential to use the knowledge uh, in the field of AML in terms of uh, data collection, data processing uh, in the field of ESG. So here I see certain certain synergies possible, but they they have to be reaped. Yeah, they will not come there by by themselves. So yeah, the central banks, the supervisors, the European Central Bank, the Latvian Central Bank, the supervisory authorities, we are not the policy makers. We are the policy takers and uh, we are doing everything what the policy makers are telling us to do. Uh, so now at the ECB level, there is really a tremendous job happening to really set up the process, how to assess the ESG risks and how to incorporate them in the, the, the supervisory evaluation process. Uh, my feeling is still, and, and this is quite a controversial, uh, what I will, I'm going to say, uh, none of the uh, capital requirements, uh, LCR, liquidity requirements, any of those like mathematical requirements will never protect the reputation of the institution which has a poor governance. And I I'm truly believe that uh, starting with the setting up the governance structure, really talking about both AML, ESG aspects, because those are the modern risks in our society, uh, it should be fine to have the proper tone at the top and really engage and devote resources to that. So, uh, yeah, we are working hard on the European level uh, to align the procedures among uh, member states. Uh, 
the, the significant institutions have already received quite a detailed questionnaires to answer, but we use it as a learning curve for ourselves as a supervisors. Banks probably are crazy about that this is too burdensome at some point in time, but we need to collect the information and really establish processes. So I think we are here in the same boat. We are th going through the learning curve and uh, yeah, we just need to commit to those goals and everything should be fine. Great. Uh, Eva, what is the, the opportunities for the for the financial sector, which are coming out of the, all of this topic, uh, you know, regarding the combination between the uh, IML, the lessons learned, uh, you know, the sustainability, which uh, banks and the financial institutions are driving forward for actually together with the clients? Mm -hmm. Um, I think one, one thing which has not been mentioned here, but uh, I think this is something which we have to acknowledge, that uh, we all talk about ESG and all three letters are extremely important and they are very much connected. So you can't disconnect and say, now we will look only on the governance and we will forget about other letters. But at the same time, currently environment is the burning issue. And I think we can't uh, deny it that the climate change is here, so we have to address it. And because of that, climate has become the top uh, top line for everybody. So, and we sort of a little bit starting to to um, forget about social and governance. But uh, I think that's how how current environment demands from us. Uh, regarding the financial sector, I think let's take the opportunity. Uh, I would encourage everybody, every institution, not to be afraid to be a pioneer, because if climate change is happening, so there is an opportunity for all of us to benefit somehow from this change, from this transformation. And uh, from my experience, engage customers as fast as you can and commercialize, monetize, whatever you do with this regulation, think how can you bring benefit to the customers, to economy, and how can you make it positive at the end of the day? This should not be, Christine, a burden for us and uh, uh, another layer, layer of uh, people uh, just working on reporting. This should be the benefit for customers, benefit for economy. And uh, currently, I think it's easier to say, if I would be speaking here like uh, two years ago, I think it would sound a bit strange, but now when energy prices are up, energy availability has been challenged, now we feel that all, also our customers are much more active approaching us, and we are fi finding more and more those common dialogues, how to approach it, how to get them uh, benefiting and uh, making it as a business case and us financing it and supporting with advice. So, yeah, use opportunity to, to get something out, positive economic out to the customer. Thank you very much. I think, Eva, you have uh, very nicely summarized uh, what we have heard today. So, uh, ESG and IML have very much in common. This is a long-term perspective. The uh, central sort of the tone from the top is what is needed. The involvement not only of the regulator and the financial institution, but the involvement of the whole society is key. And this is the key driver to be able to really use those opportunities what Eva have mentioned. Thank you very much for participating in this panel and thank you very much for all of your advice. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. We are proceeding with a very important uh, second part of the conference, ESG in the world of war. We will explore the links between ESG targets and the consequences of war, especially in the context of the social dimension and we speak about social dimension, it is of course the aspects of migration, availability of financial services for refugees, fighting human trafficking, all very uh, important subjects. 
And also we will focus on the migration crisis caused by the Russia's war in Ukraine and the need for adequate and risk-based reaction to ensure the availability of the financial services um, to the refugees. So, and with this, I would like to invite to the stage our esteemed guests from Ukraine, Maria Kolhanova, who is the executive director of the Independent Association of the Banks of Ukraine. So, uh, this association is the natural counterpart of the Finance Latvia Association. So, you represent our Ukrainian sisters and brothers. That is true. Give, let's, let's give a round of applause to Maria. <laughs> Maria, you have yourself extensive experience in the banking sector, right? So, being part of the association for more than 10 years already. Yep, we're and like we're the sister of uh, the uh, Latvian Banking Association, but we're a little bit younger. We have like 12 years of experience, so I'm yeah from since the beginning. Fantastic, and so obviously as an executive uh, director of uh, NABU, you are now in a leadership uh, position and uh, basically leading the organization through these very challenging times. And uh, we are very uh, much welcoming you and very much uh, value your reflections. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. So, dear friends, dear colleagues, first of all, it's definitely a real pleasure for me to be here with you. It's a pleasure to congratulate the uh, Banking Association with the, uh, your birthday. So, happy birthday and thank you for having us today. Um, my presentation today will be mostly about like the key figures and key numbers about uh, the banking system and the infrastructure. Um, but I would ask you to maybe think about, think deeply about the facts and about the key figures that I'm going to uh, be showing you today and try to see the actually titanic efforts of all the Ukrainians behind them and of course all the international partners and we continue to thank all of you and all the countries for supporting us these days. So, as, as all of us know, it's already more than a year of the war. And what do we have now? First of all, this will be like a couple of slides about the facts that describe the current situation in Ukraine. Uh, first of all, the banks do work. So 65 banks of Ukraine continue to operate stably. Uh, before the war, we had 71 bank um, operating in Ukraine, but uh, the number has reduced only due to the fact that we sort of say goodbye to the daughters of Russian st state-owned banks and just Russian banks. Uh, so all the rest are operating and uh, as you may see that of course we had uh, have had a slight decrease in the number of the branches that are operating in Ukraine of banks but uh, together with the regulator it has been introduced a uh, power banking mode. I will tell in, in a couple of more details about that later. But it really helps the banks to continue operating even in the times of the blackouts and all the rest. So the next fact about Ukrainian banking system is that the amount of money in the banks is really increasing. So we have an increase in uh, our national currency deposits in green uh, of the population and uh, since the February 24th, so since the like large scale uh, war began, uh, the amount of people's money in banks uh, has increased by almost 4 billion euros so and by 22.5% 22, uh, since the beginning of like last year. Uh, also since the beginning of the war uh, the volume of the green accounts of business has also increased. Uh, we do of course have a, like a small outflow of the currency but it is absolutely not, not critical so even not needed to be shown like a separate slide here. Uh, the second point about uh, that may describe the situation today is that we really do have high liquidity. So the banking system has liquidity enough to even think about continuing lending. So since the beginning of the war, uh, the level has not fallen below than 4 billion euro. And it's, uh, uh, today's level is even higher. So as you may see, it's about uh, it's about 15 billion euros, so it's more than enough to service all the liabilities and, as I mentioned before, even to think about continuing lending. Uh, 
the next point that we're sort of proud of is that the banks are really, really well capitalized. If we talk about maybe the most representative factors would be that uh, the systematically important banks, so we have that, that group of banks in Ukraine, uh, they, uh, they support the H2 ratio, so the adequacy capital ratio. Uh, much higher than the minimal, the minimal rate, so it shows really nice results about the liquidity. And the last, and definitely not the least, if we talk about the key facts about the situation now in Ukraine, is that we really do lend. So uh, the lending has not stopped for for a long time, of course, in the beginning when the war when the war started, all the banks were focusing more on like establishing uh, the financial restructuring procedures, on establishing the, the uh, credit holidays and all the rest. But in general, uh, the banks continue lending. The banks continue to lend, especially to small and medium business, especially to ag agriculture, of course, because it's the uh, the sphere that is supporting Ukraine all all these days, and uh, the banks are working really tightly together with the uh, with the state, introducing new programs of state support. The banks are working really tightly with the international partners. So this also leads us to the uh, to the point that we do lend. Uh, now just a couple of words about how we actually managed to do that. So what made it possible? Uh, first of all, we have maybe two parts to, to describe that. So first is the really fast and coordinated work of our regulator of the National Bank of Ukraine. And uh, if we talk about uh, the second block, it's maybe more about the corona crisis. So it's the fact that we had like a rehearsal for the banks working online, for the banks uh, integrating with the, with the clients online and facing the, like the major challenges. So the pre-war package of reforms and the pre-war readiness of the sector to uh, work in unpredictable circumstances also led to the fact that we were sort of ready, if we can, if we can tell like that. This is maybe our slide of gratitude also to the regulator, to the National Bank of Ukraine, because of its fast and, as I mentioned before, coordinated work. So a couple of historical facts. The bombs, if we talk about 24th of February, uh, the bombs started falling on Kiev and on all the cities actually in Ukraine at 4 a.m. Uh, and at 9 a.m. the regulator already published and uh, spread among, among the banks and among the financial institutions, the, as we call it, emergency package of the regulation. And that emergency package included like uh, main restrictions about not, ha not, not happening the currency outflow. It can, it's included all the main like descriptions of how the bank should work. And it really helped the bank not to cause panic among the clients, among themselves, and to continue operating. So this is the slide about power banking I was talking about. Uh, it's uh, the mode that had been introduced by the regulator that really helped Ukraine to survive mostly this winter. So this is um, the, we can call it a network of the systematically important branches of, all, of uh, uh, the banks. So at, at first that, that was the idea to make a network of just a, a branches of a couple of banks. But actually all the branches, uh, mostly all the branches also joined the initiative. And even during the blackouts, it's uh, this power banking mode offered Ukra like just Ukrainian people to get access to the main banking services and to the main, main banking operations, even when there was no light, no just sources, and the this, this situation didn't, offer, didn't allow any other business to work, you still could have access to the banking services, at, le at least to many of them. So here, here at the screen, you may see uh, the list of that. So receiving cash, the ATMs for sure, and we'll have a separate slate about receiving cash. Uh, certain payments, technical self-service, uh, even some sort of services available at the cash desk. So first, uh, the idea was to unite maybe about 100 branches just to provide at least some access for banking services. But as you may see, uh, more more than two southern, branch, southern branches of Ukrainian banks joined that, so we have literally no problem for providing access to banking services in any areas and uh, under any circumstances. Uh, 
Uh, this is the slide that, that I promised you. It's about uh, the actually reducing the panic among the population so and dealing with the money with withdrawal. We had a couple of steps made by the banks, by the regulator, by the parliament and actually by the whole market to reduce the panic uh, about actually like having the access to cash. So first of all, the, the banks immediately issued the funds to any clients who wanted them right now and it really helped to I don't know, to people to communicate to each other and understand that there, there is actually no problem in just get, getting your funds from the bank. The second issue is that the banks, uh, in cooperation with the international payment systems, with the regulator, with the specialized ministries, they introduced the mode of maximum assistance for non-cash payments. That also helped a lot, so people understood that uh, nothing is happening to their banking card. They can still use it, they can still do all the services, and there was no panic just to with, withdraw the money. And uh, uh, the National Bank also helped with establishing the really adequate limits. So you, you saw that it's not about like, I don't know, 10 euros for a week. And everybody saw that the amounts are really great for, for you to live. And there, there are no restrictions and no restrictions are planned. And the National Bank has been introducing, like spreading the limits. So people saw that uh, there, there is no problem. And maybe the main aspect in this area is the fact that during the parliament guaranteed 100% the uh, deposits of all the Ukrainians in all the banks during the war. So after this law has been adopted, and it's been maybe in the first week of war, the panic was reduced to zero, to the level of zero. Nobody was worried about their money, and we had actually no, no percentage of withdrawing of the banks caused, caused by panic. So uh, this... I think that maybe I have a lot of slides, you know, about be, being proud of our banking system. Maybe, of course, the organizers will share and I will not need to talk about all the steps. So, yeah, there were also a couple of steps made by the regulator you know, in order to support not just the population, but the, but the banks as well. So, for example, the regulator also provided the possibility for getting for getting loans, but it's not also a really popular tool used used by the banks. They were just uh, they were just really confident because they had such a possibility. Um, I actually managed, uh, oh, oh, sorry, I actually already included this. So the pre-war reform and the Corona crisis really helped us a lot. No need to no need to step here. And if we talk about the main uh, the main conclusions is that there are actually no like no stable prospects and no stable vision of any experts on the real future of the GDP, on the real future of losses, and etc. Because even if we talk about the uh, the prospects of the IMF, they really have the variation from minus three to plus one percent annually, and. So the war is uh, the war means unpredict unpredictability, and that is it. Maybe this is the main point of the slide. Uh, why so? Because uh, as for now, we have uh, tons of losses if we talk about infrastructure. So you may see uh, you may see at the screen that as for now, and this slide does not count the infrastructure. So the, this does not count like any losses caused by the blackouts, bombing the infrastructural network and etc so we have like more than 50 billion of dollars to just to the buildings uh, tra transport infrastructure 36.2 for business it's 11.3 but it f f like the losses to the business are actually also not not so easy to count because it's uh, also it's a variation of, of, of the, uh, the losses it may be and of course the the point that I really need to mention is that also almost 50 percent of the uh, of the energetic infrastructure has been damaged but we can get back actually to this slide about power banking. We still managed to do that if we talk if we talk about the banks. Uh, this is maybe uh, al already finishing because we don't have really really so much time. It's already the uh, slide about the current situation. So uh, the current situation about. Uh, the fact that these days the investment climate is not really so great, but of course we will be working on that and we'll be working with the whole world, with the whole uh, 
with all the international partners that and thank you again for supporting us so of course this is a big problem in exporting the grain of course the like the great so-called grain corridor helped a little bit but there is there is still a really big number of problems uh, we have a loss in uh, in the production of steel because of the uh, because of the situation in Mariupol, so it's like uh, first of all it was the, the loss in three four times. Now we managed to reduce it to two times, so it's already of course getting better. Um, the also one of the important aspects is that uh, Ukraine lost a lot of people. Like of course we we think uh, we think that they will definitely get back. That is why we don't really love the the word refugees because all of us are really actually planning planning to get back home. And of course, the economy is also forced to move to the uh, to move from the east, usually to the central or to the central part of Ukraine or to the western, and this causes also a lot of problems for the uh, for the people and business. So I think I'm going to be finishing now because we don't obviously have time, but this is my slide to tell thank you to all the international partners and we know that we are already in process of building like mutual plans and plans for the future and I'm sure that together we will win really soon. And thank you Europe, thank you Latvia, thank you. <laughs> <coughs> Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Maria. I mean, your sector, you yourself, you have demonstrated so remarkable resilience. And I see even progress despite the war. That is a result of remarkable achievement. Thank you so much Thank again. Thank you for having Thank me. You Thank so you. <clears throat> And we continue the work of the conference uh, with a presentation from Dr. Amandine Scherer, who is policy expert at European Banking Authority to discuss the banking sector reacting to the migration crisis, do's and don'ts, and best practices. Uh, welcome, Amandine. And uh, yes. <laughs> So, Amandine, you are um, you obviously you are from the uh, well. Since you have a PhD degree, you um, are in the academic field, but you know you are the active academic. This is this is characterized by your more than 25 publications. That is that is very remarkable, and you currently work at EBA as a policy expert in the AML CFT unit. Therefore, um, you also work on de-risking and its impact on access to financial services. We're very much looking forward to your uh, reflections on the social element within the ESG equation. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Marish. Good morning, everyone, and it's a pleasure to be part of this conference today uh, on such important topics. And I'd like to thank once more the Finance Latvia Association for the invitation. So I am here today to uh, share with you some regulatory insights on a very important issue that has actually gained very significant uh, in the last few years, which is the financial inclusion of refugees in the EU. But before I go into this uh, area, I just would like to briefly explain what is the role of the EBA, because I am not so sure if you are all familiar with what we do. So just very briefly for those of you again who may not be familiar with the European Banking Authority, we are one of the three European supervisory authorities and we work to maintain the stability and effectiveness of the EU financial system. We also have in the AML field a legal mandate to prevent, to prevent the abuse of the financial system for money laundering and terrorist financing purposes and we have a duty to lead, coordinate and monitor the fight against money laundering and terrorist financing in the EU. And so we will fulfill this mandate up until the new EU IML authority, the AMLA, is set up. So as I said at the beginning, I am here today to share some insight about the work that we have done in the EBA when it comes to the financial inclusion of refugees. So of course, this is not entirely a new issue. And back in 2016, in the middle of, in, in the, middle of the refugee crisis and in the context of the war in Syria, 
it already became apparent that the influx of asylum seekers created actually significant compliance challenges for banks. For instance, we saw that banks experienced difficulty to verify the identity of the asylum seeker because traditional forms of ID were actually missing, like passports or ID cards. And these customer due diligence challenges were exacerbated uh, at the time because these asylum seekers were actually coming from a higher risk jurisdiction from a money laundering and terrorist financing perspective. So this, of course, created a dramatic situation in which you had people in great despair who were fleeing war and conflicts and were unable to access the financial services they needed to survive in the host society they had found refuge. And I believe we all realize here in the audience that getting access to an account through which a refugee can receive money, send money, save money, pay bills, build a credit score, is of paramount importance to be part of the society. So what we've done back in 2016, so again in a different context, the EBA issued an opinion on the application of customer due diligence measure to customers who are asylum seekers. And this was really an important step to help financial institutions to strike the right balance on, on the one hand, providing access to the basic services refugee need, and on the other hand, to comply with EU AML CFT requirement. At the time, we already made clear, as part of this uh, opinion, that the EU framework was actually sufficiently flexible to permit an effective response, and that, in reality, there should be very limited cases in which financial institutions would need to decline a business relationship with, uh, with a refugee on money laundering and terrorist financing grounds. This opinion, back in 2016, was followed from very intensive further work on our side at the EBA, and we have made a call for input in order to gather further, uh, further evidence from the stakeholders who were, who, were, who were mostly affected by the risking. And all this work led to an, the publication of another opinion in 2022, so our EBA opinion on the risking. Where here, the key message as part of this opinion was that the risking of entire categories of customers without due consideration of the individual customer risk profile can be unwarranted and can even amount to ineffective money laundering and terrorist financing risk management. And this is where I am coming now with the current context of the war in Ukraine, because our publication back in January 2022 actually coincided with the outbreak of the war in Ukraine. Following the invasion of Ukraine, millions of people have found refuge in EU member states. And similarly to what has happened during the 2016 refugee crisis, we started to receive evidence that some asylum seekers were experiencing difficulties to access basic bank accounts. And this was in spite of the fact that the EU enacted a temporary protection directive to respond to the need of the Ukrainian refugees. And the directive actually included very explicit provisions supporting the access to financial services, allowing for Ukrainian refugees to open account in the 27 EU member states with the possibilities for banks to apply simplified due diligence. On our side, on the EBA side, we nevertheless thought that the temporary directive should be complemented by a statement. So this is why, in, as soon as April 2022, the EBA issued a statement in which we set out what financial institutions can do to provide financial access to refugees from UPN. And with this statement, we actually called on financial institutions to ensure that the compliance with the EU restrictive measures regime does not lead to, again, unwarranted de-risking. We were actually very pleased to see that this call was widely relayed in Latvia, including by the Finance Latvia Association, and we have received evidence that several banks in Latvia introduced simplified procedure for the opening of basic accounts and the insurance of payment card for Ukrainian refugees. Nevertheless, building again on the guidance we provided as part of our first opinion back in 2016, with the next opinion in 2022, we thought that there was room for further clarification and further reinforcement. And so we decided to issue a whole new set of guidelines addressed to the financial sector in order to make sure that the guidance was there and was used as a key reference uh, when it comes to financial inclusion. So, 
At the end of March, so last month, we actually published our brand new guidelines on policies and controls for the effective management of money laundering and terrorist financing risk when providing access to financial services. These new, these new guidelines are not entirely focused on refugees, but they do contain specific provisions that are explicitly designed for customers who are asylum seekers or refugees. And in particular, the guidelines aim at ensuring that there is a common understanding by institution and AML CFT supervisors as well of what is effective money laundering and terrorist financing risk management in situations where access by customer to financial services should be safeguarded and in particular for the most vulnerable customers. So in practice, let me briefly explain how, how these guidance can be useful and help, help your institution to overcome the challenges of onboarding refugees. So first, as a general principle, the guidelines make clear that before taking a decision to reject a business relationship with an individual customer, Financial institutions should first consider all the possible measures that could be taken to mitigate the risk associated with this particular customer. And in the guidance, actually, we give concrete examples of what, what can be done in that respect. It could be, for instance, the adjustment of monitoring, a restriction on some services or product to, in order to mitigate the risk, including the provision of an account with basic features, also in line with what is required in the Payment Account Directive. To overcome the challenge of ID verification, we also provided guidance on how to handle application from individuals who, again, are not always able to provide traditional forms of ID, such as passport, or who may not have a fixed address. And here we provide, again, very concrete example of alternative documentation that can be used by bank. For instance, official documentation provided by the country of refuge, documentation provided by an official authority, social services, but also not-for-profit organization working on behalf of such official authorities. Of course, in the guidelines, we, we take into account the fact that many of the challenges will occur for banks at the onboarding stage of refugees. But many of these challenges will become less significant once actually the bank gets to get a better understanding of the customer. And over time, banks can update the individual risk assessment of the customer, adjust the, the extent of monitoring, but also revisit the type of products and services for which that customer is eligible. So concretely, this means that once an asylum seeker has obtained its official refugee status, and if he or she decides to remain in the host country, then this individual will be able to have a job, to start receiving stable income, and therefore to start and build a credit history in the bank in which the account was initially open. And this way, the banks can get a better understanding of the customer's risk profile and even consider offering further services to these customers, for instance, loans, mortgages, so that actually these individuals, this newly integrated individual in the society, can fully participate in the economy as well. So I, will, I would really encourage you to have a close look at these guidelines. Uh, they are really meant, again, to support you as financial institution in maintaining financial inclusion for vulnerable customers, but also as a result that you can fully embrace the social responsibilities that is very important, of course, as, uh, as part of your everyday work. So let me just recap a, a couple of key messages here. First. Refugees are particularly vulnerable customers, and the financial inclusion in their whole society is an absolute necessity for their integration. On the other hand, the financial exclusion of refugees can also put them at risk of being exploited, for instance, for human trafficking purposes, and I believe the next session will be discussing that further. Refugees, therefore, require specific procedures to ensure they can access the financial services they need, that they need to be fully integrated in the society. And to conclude, maybe on a more positive and optimist note, what is really encouraging is that we have actually seen that banks can easily react to these kind of challenges. And I have, I have mentioned a couple of examples, but we do have, have many examples of banks who have adapted their, their onboarding process after the first influx of refugees in that jurisdiction. So we strongly believe that the financial sector has a very important role to play here. So thank you very much. And again, the guidelines are, are publicly available, so you are more than welcome to have a look. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Amandine. And again, also, thanks for being so actually prompt uh, with, uh, with the guidelines, right, in these uh, challenging circumstances. And I get just one very brief follow-up question. So obviously, the guidelines are of high quality and, and there is the content thereof. But, but still, on the implementation, on the practical application, do you have some procedures or platform in place of cooperation with the local regulators, the industry? Mm -hmm. So the way we have designed these guidelines is actually it has followed the, uh, the internal governance process at the EBA in which we are constantly consulting with all the regulators across the EU. We have a standing committee that gathers all supervisors across the EU and the preparation of the guideline first drafts has been heavily discussed in this forum. And of course, this was approved by the supervisors as well before publication. We have also followed the public consultation process mm -hmm. uh, before finalizing the guidelines. We have received quite a number of um, contributions from various stakeholders. And we, in, in the final document, you can see at the end, there is a feedback table that actually summarizes all the input that we have received and what we have taken on board for what reason and what we couldn't take on board also explaining why. So it's, it's, it's a very heavy but I would say very robust process we have in place when we issue guidelines because we do acknowledge that there is a legislative difference across the EU. Like for instance, we know that in some member states it's just not possible to accept alternative form of ID. And this is the case in Germany, for instance. So this is why in the guidelines, we are always careful to nuance where we can and when we say we're permitted by national law, because indeed the EU framework is not exactly there because we're talking about minimum harmonization there. And this is why we are also hoping that the single rule that the single rule book will, 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 will really help to provide more certainty and more clarity for the whole sector okay. across the EU. Clear, because exactly, the guidelines is, 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 is part of the process, but adoption and understanding yeah. is the core yes. of the observance. Indeed. Thank you. Indeed. Applause for Amandine. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Now it's time for another great panel discussion on the compliance with AML CFT requirements, how to respond to migration to mitigate risks of human trafficking, a very challenging topic. But um, this discussion will be led by the, I would say, star of uh, compliance consulting and advisory uh, in the Baltics, Jan Skowlinge, who is not only partner at EY, but uh, Janis, you have an array of titles and credentials. CAMS, CAMS audit, CFA, FCA. This one I particularly like, CIA, um, <laughs> CISSP. Janis, you will lead a, a great uh, discussion uh, of, of participants, uh, including Frank Haberstraw, who is anti-financial crime specialist for the Finance Against Slavery and Trafficking Initiative, which is a project based at the United Nations University Center for Policy Research. Welcome, Frank. We will have Karina Lindava, the head of anti financial crime, member of the management board at Swedbank Latvia. And we have Agnese Lartz, senior policy analyst at Providos, the NGO organization. Have a great discussion. Thanks so much, Mari, for the introductions. Um, good afternoon, dear audience. Um, I'm really honored to be here today and with my esteemed panelists, have this chance to discuss this topic, which is on one hand uh, a really complex one, and at the same time, it's a really uh, tragic uh, matter that we need to address. Um, by way of um, introduction uh, besides the you know the certifications and such i can just say that on my daily uh, in in my daily life i uh, work with aml matters as well as the esg matters and so for me it's it's crystal clear that that uh, for 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 my clients it is super hard to find this balance even within the aml and even within the esg 
And if we juxtapose the kind of the tragic con consequences of the Russian invasion of um, uh, Ukraine and then the migration and then the human trafficking risks which are there with this balanced approach of compliance and, and responding to it, then, then it's not at all uh, easy. Uh, just to share a few statistics before we jump in uh, per discussion with, with the Latvian head of FIU, uh, Tuom Spatacis, during the coffee break. Um, so within the um, 10 million um, refugees, and by the way, let's perhaps here use the word temporarily displaced uh, people rather than refugees. Um, out of those 10 million, 90% uh, are women and children. And what perhaps illustrates the, the real risk here is that, uh, for example, in the United Kingdom, the statistics, uh, just the internet searches for Ukrainian escorts or Ukrainian pornography since the beginning of the war, it has gone up by 200% uh, and 600% respectively. So the risk is real, the risk is there, and, um, and uh, we all are here to tackle it. Uh, Frank, if you could be so kind as to provide this bigger picture of uh, uh, migration and then the human trafficking risks from your more regional and global perspective. Sure, uh, happy to do so. Um, well, generally speaking, whenever we have a migration crisis with uh, large numbers of displaced people, um, we will see an increase in human trafficking activities as well. And uh, this is because war, uh, hunger, um, economic distress causes an increase in vulnerability of the affected population. And human traffickers know exactly well how to exploit that vulnerability. Um, so if a Ukrainian woman flees her country and reaches the border to, um, with nothing, um, totally exhausted, and um, somebody offers her to, to bring her in a private car to a secure place, um, she probably is going to accept that offer without knowing if it is a great act of humanity or a trap by a human trafficker. Um, the same is going to happen when she reaches her final destination and she gets a um, dubious job offer she usually wouldn't accept, um, but which she is going to accept because of her vulnerability, um, because she has not much choices. So um, vulnerability is really in the center um, of, of the problem. It's the fuel of the human trafficking engine. Um, and well, when it comes to UN, um, to, to our global agenda, the Sustainable Development Goals, this um, engine is um, thought about, uh, thought to um, be stopped. Um, human trafficking, modern slavery, forced labor is thought to be ended by 2030. Um, this is certainly very ambitious, um, especially if we look at the current numbers. Um, currently, the last estimates by the ILO are that we have 49.6 million uh, people in a situation of modern slavery worldwide. And um, this is 10 million more than we had in the last estimates from 2016. So um, are we getting worse in fighting human trafficking? Um, honestly, I don't think so. I think uh, awareness is raising. Um, this, this very event here is is a good example of it. Um, states are getting better. Um, Latvia is getting better. Um, we see referral me mechanisms for victims. Um, we see national action plans um, for human trafficking, increased numbers of investigations. But um, to, to use maybe the, the banking language, um, although our um, mitigating measures have become much better, the cross risks simply increased dramatically. And I think it's not, it's not a surprise. Look at our world. Um, we have climate crisis that make people move. We had, had have, will have the COVID-19 pandemic, um, which caused extreme economic distress. Um, we have countries using migration as a geopolitical weapon, like Belarus did. And obviously, we have the war um, and in Ukraine and other, and other places as well, um, causing millions of people to flee, all of them under increased risk of human trafficking. So um, thank you. Thank you to, to Finance Latvia to have this event, to give this topic a stage um, and to join the efforts. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Frank. Perhaps turning to the Latvian reality, uh, Agnes, if you could comment on it really from your experience as uh, I'm sure that for the average person on the street, you know, this topic could 
be somewhat remote and you know something that you read in the news but you don't really experience it on daily basis please Yes, uh, thank you for, for giving uh, the NGO sector uh, the floor. Uh, along my position as a senior policy analyst at Providus, I'm also a board member of one of the largest NGOs working with refugees in Latvia. I want to help refugees. Um, and um, as many of you know, uh, the arrival of Ukrainian refugees here in Latvia has been something unprecedented for us. If before we would have a maximum of 500 asylum applications per year, then in the past year, uh, in a little bit, uh, over 40,000 people have arrived in Latvia and um, from Ukraine. Uh, and as Jans mentioned, um, 85%, around 85% of them are uh, women and children. So. Uh, a rather vulnerable group. Uh, and um, the access to financial services uh, and the import importance of them have uh, been highlighted in many um, parts of their journey and settlement here in, in Latvia. Um, last year, uh, I coordinated uh, a group of volunteer drivers uh, who went and met Ukrainian refugees at the Polish-Latvian border. Maybe some of you went with your own car. Uh, but afterwards, uh, and, and we saw the anti-human trafficking measures develop on the Polish side if, uh, in the very first days uh, of the war. There were reports of people just uh, essentially hitchhiking um, and getting into very dangerous situations. And with time, the Polish border guard and the NGOs there uh, introduced many measures to, to prevent this from happening. There was also just pamphlets being passed out to people uh, to also watch out for, for signs of suspicious activity. Um, but with time from volunteer drivers, we got to a cooperation with a bus company that offered discounts on their tickets, uh, and we uh, covered uh, a part of the ticket. But as a measure of also giving refugees themselves agency, um, they uh, had to still purchase this ticket online. Um, and because there were some issues with accessing their own accounts uh, or uh, with using Ukrainian bank cards and online payments and so on, uh, many of them actually couldn't even pay these 10 euros online to buy a bus ticket, which doesn't seem like a lot, but that created situations for them where, uh, where uh, possibly threats were. But then after uh, the arrival, um, access to financial services is something that first helps them uh, access basic needs, housing, paying deposits, paying rent, um, uh, access to employment. There are many employers in Latvia who do not want to pay in cash, even though our labor law permits it. Uh, and this has been an issue for refugees for a long time when they have the right to work, even uh, still in, at the stage of asylum seeking. Uh, they. Um, uh, sometimes struggle opening a bank account, and that uh, um, indirectly pushes them in, in the gray zone of the economy, agreeing to, to get uh, their salaries in the so-called proverbial envelope. Um, and um, it is also um, about their uh, kind of long-term uh, planning uh, in, in the respective host society. Uh, and a, a thought that, of course, this panel highlights very well is that integration we often think is uh, a task of uh, a mystical government or maybe a, a department at the Ministry of Culture, but it's actually um, a cross-sectoral effort um, that involves the public, the private sector, and the NGOs, and the task is to ensure the access to services, and also change the language that we use when talking about refugees. But because oftentimes, and especially before the war in Ukraine, which has increased the understanding of the Latvian society of the refugee needs uh, and experiences a lot, but before that, the, uh, the, the kind of uh, th threat framing, uh, risk framing of refugees is something that also affects their um, uh, their prospects and their start of life in uh, in a new country. 
Thanks. Thanks, Agnes. I think it clear, clearly uh, illustrates the kind of this fundamental uh, need for access to financial services. You know, not being able to pay 10 euros for the bus ticket. I think this kind of gets at the core of it. So, Karin, uh, representing uh, the leading bank in, in Latvia, in the Baltics, in the region, um, what does this look like from your perspective, from the industry perspective, how to tackle this challenge of um, ensuring financial access at the same time managing the risk? from all sides. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Yanis. Uh, good day, dear audience. Uh, I'm really honored to be here and uh, represent financial industry in this discussion. Uh, Swedbank, being the largest bank uh, in Latvia, acknowledges the social responsibility it has. And that doesn't go only to refugees. It's uh, much broader uh, to, to offer services and uh, access to financial uh, services and the system as such. And of course, uh, if we talk about a particular situation, uh, Ukrainian uh, refugees, um, then it has been unprecedented uh, year, which we experienced last year. And if you look on the statistics, then uh, last year alone, uh, we onboarded in Baltic, all three Baltic countries, around 50,000 Ukrainian refugees, which is really considerable uh, volume. Uh, when it comes to the spread through the timeline, a uh, majority of uh, accounts were opened in upcoming months after the war started in Ukraine. And as you all know, then financial industry at the same time had to introduce all the sanction requirements as well. So it has been really challenging, uh, no doubt about that. But uh, here, uh, what has been critical that there is saying, if there is a will, there is a way, right? And since this situation was really close to our border and we had really kind of big empathy towards this, we understood, and not only in the bank, in Swedbank, but the whole financial industry, we understood the importance and also the government understood the importance and was ready to find a solution for the situation. And here I have to say big thanks to our Financial Industry Association, which did a really great job uh, because they mobilized everyone around the table and we had discussions to share views, to hear the perspective from the government and what they are about to do. And we had a lot of discussions to find a solution so we are capable to take on uh, and ensure uh, account accessibility to refugees. Uh, if we look on uh, the um, uh, refugees, then here the challenge, what you, Janis, mentioned is, and that doesn't go only to refugees, but overall, uh, acknowledging the social responsibility and offering the access to accounts, and we understand that refugees is kind of more vulnerable population, right? But at the same time, not everyone coming from Ukraine or any other country uh, from abroad, not everyone comes with uh, good intentions, right? So at the same time, we also need to kind of jangle or balance out the uh, risk mitigation actions and ensure that our system is not being abused. Indeed. Thanks, uh, Karin. And, and perhaps to develop this point of um, how to exactly balance the, let's say, the objectively increased risk due to individuals who are part of the, let's say, the population of temporarily displaced people who don't have the best of intentions, uh, etc. Um, so perhaps what, what are the um, lessons learned and perhaps which are the solutions which are not the most optimal in terms of the lessons learned uh, globally when responding to such crises? Uh, Frank, if you um, sure. Well, when we're talking about lessons learned, it's more about um, if you do something at all, and um, this is very important on a state level, um, to include the financial industry in the fight against human trafficking. And I'm not saying that because of the audience. I'm saying that because it's a fact. Um, you have to be aware that um, human trafficking is a crime that happens in the shadows. 
um, and usually you will have a problem to have the initial proof to start an investigation. And this is because the victims um, are often reluctant to go to the police because they don't trust them or because they fear um, retaliation by the enslavers. So the financial industry and financial intelligence um, showing suspicious activities can really replace that initial um, proof and hereby cause um, a criminal investigation. Um, a state who wants to foster that should certainly do two things. One thing is to um, implement a PPP. Um, Latvia has one, but a PPP specifically on human trafficking. Um, we're seeing that globally um, as a phenomenon. It's arising everywhere. And the other thing is um, to include human trafficking in the um, money laundering risk assessment, because then banks have to react to it. Um, and I leave it with that. Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks so much. And uh, uh, perhaps then um, uh, getting back to the banks who are reacting to it, um, uh, Karin, if you can, if, if you can comment on this, uh, you know, uh, again, this tension of, uh, you know, as as uh, uh, representing an auditor firm, I know very well that when we were to audit, let's say, the AML compliance of a bank, we would look at the KYC file, and we would say, hey, you know, this procedure is not, has not been completed because of the lack of documentation on source of funds, etc., etc. Of course, the question would be why and on what legal basis and what risks this creates, etc. How, how are you managing this challenge in, in substance? Uh, and also, perhaps you can refer to the kind of the state uh, authorities' support and understanding. Mm. Uh, here, uh, it's really important to um, and uh, to distinguish the one is what is written the standards what's must to apply and then there is interpretation and also then again acknowledging the situation uh, where those people are coming from that there is war going on in their country then not always we can fulfill like directly as it is written for example a bank is obliged to make sure that source of funds are clear and to do so, we need underlying documentation. If the larger amount is coming into account, we need to understand the purpose of it and the origin of those funds. And just one example, uh, we had one Ukrainian refugee receiving pretty considerable amount in his account, and then we tried to reach out to the person. We cannot reach out because there is no response. And when finally we did, person says, what explanation? I'm fighting in the ward. I, I'm in the bottle field. I cannot uh, explain you anything right now. So, and then what we're we supposed to do in this situation, freeze the account and consider that this is illicit money? We don't have any answers. And here the question comes, after a few years, we're going to have this file. It's not clear if we're going to have this response or not from him, what's going to happen with the person at the end. But the question is, uh, in few years, we're going to have uh, FSA inspection. And then the question, how our supervisor will look on this file, as you say, because it comes down to the concrete files and concrete situations. So I would say for a bank, it is really challenging to deal with these kind of exceptions, because this is not the only one exception which we are seeing. There are many. And that goes to like every risk management system. When we build risk management system, it's not so that we build it for 90% of the base. We build it for just 1%, right? So, and this is what we, we, we see as a challenge. And sometimes, of course, and, and when it comes to banks, we are blamed whether we are not opening an account, we are bad guys. And if we do open and somebody launders money, then we are in a bad spot again. So it's kind of, yeah. A tight spot, so to speak. Yeah. But but Agnes, perhaps you could comment uh, on on let's say the best best approaches to in fact educating uh, the migrants, the temporarily displaced people, when it comes to you know how to get access to financial services in Latvia, in the Baltics, in the European Union. Right. So um, uh, whatever uh, the. Uh, uh, Finance Association Latvia and the banks uh, did uh, after uh, February last year was to come together, sit at the same table, also with institutions, with NGOs, trying to understand what the needs are. And the output was something that actually could be learned from, was a, essentially a one-pager infograph on 
uh, how to access um, uh, access the account, what banks were uh, open to opening the uh, accounts for Ukrainians, and it was a rather straightforward procedure. Um, there. Uh, spread out both in Latvian and in Ukrainian so that locals who support Ukrainians here could also uh, get themselves acquainted with this. Um, however, um, it, it's not only about educating Ukrainians uh, because uh, what we've encountered uh, when uh, Ukrainians try to actually access this service is that the understanding among tellers themselves uh, is varied. Uh, so training uh, also of employees, perhaps engaging them with Ukrainians, playing out various situations because uh, uh, in comparison to other migrants, actually Ukrainians are oftentimes accepted without paper documents, uh, taking into account the situation. Um, or their residence permits did not have to be actually prolonged so that it says so in the passport. It was something that there was a law that says that, or cabinet regulations that says these uh, residence permits are valid uh, until uh, March next year, but many bank tellers still requested them to bring uh, residence permits with this new expiry date. So that caused a lot of turmoil, uh, stress for for Ukrainians themselves. So I guess it's uh, kind of creating perhaps a forum where some of these challenges can be addressed, not only one-off um, development of services, but then also improvement uh, afterwards, uh, talking between various sectors. Um, and uh, sometimes also um, uh, the requirements vary across banks um, and uh, sometimes some of these um, different situations just become kind of a, uh, um, a tale. Uh, among uh, the refugees themselves. We see these discussions develop on Facebook uh, where they discuss their experience. So uh, again, making, uh, creating a platform where this information is always up to date, clear and straightforward. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Agnes. I guess the point is that it's not just about, uh, you know, any single group, uh, either the banks or, or the um, temporarily displaced themselves or, or the NGOs that will solve it. We all need to come together and actually discuss and educate each other so that we are all on the same page. And also, if I may add, if we can... Uh also, uh, avoid so much of the language of the risk and the, the threat um, because also refugees themselves are, uh, they have agency, they have, uh, we need to empower them, but they mm. also bring knowledge of their own community mm. that, uh, that can be relevant for, for us to develop the services, right? Indeed, indeed. As we are running out of time, uh, perhaps just a single sentence or two from each of the esteemed panelists uh, as a call to action or perhaps a key takeaway from the discussion. Frank. Well, my key takeaway would be to, to balance um, that this is important. On the one hand, to, to grant financial inclusion, because if we don't do so, um, vulnerable groups are getting more vulnerable, and this in the end f furthers um, the crime as such. On the other hand, you have to have compliance systems uh, adequately in place to react to the specific risks. Um, so it's all about balance. Thanks. Thanks, Frank. Um, so well, we want the NGOs, the banks, the government, we all want uh, newcomers, refugees, other migrants to be included in the financial system because that actually gives us a tool to analyze their habits, to analyze their integration trajectories, to analyze their prospects in the shorter and longer term. Uh, so that should be the common goal. Thanks so much. And last but not least, Karina. Um, it's really important to have a public and private uh, discussion so that uh, both sides understand what's the common goal uh, and what each side has to contribute towards that. So discussion is super important uh, and that was the major uh, item which led us to kind of successful uh, outcome or successful setup to be able to offer accessibility to financial industry and financial system. Thanks, Karina. On which note, I'd like to conclude the panel. Thanks so much for your attention, and hopefully we can all come together and continue working to address this issue. Thank you. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thanks to the panel. Thank you so much, Janis, Frank, 
Karin and Agnes for uh, all your reflections. So uh, I, again, I was taking notes, but it's so, um, I mean, complex as, as a matter. You know, you have ethical, you have legal, you have safety, you have compliance challenges. But I really pride that I hear that our banking sector has been able to adjust fast and onboard tens and tens of thousands of refugees. And that, I think, is um, a clear achievement of its own. Thank you very much for the discussion. Let's give Thank them you. again a round of applause. I would like to welcome on the stage Andris Grafs, the Vice President of Baltic Institute of Corporate Governance. Welcome, uh, Andris. Andris, uh, I used to say that uh, you are at the helm of Latvian corporate governance, if not its father. And it's so true. I'm really so honored to work and support uh, Andris, you in your, uh, all in your efforts. You are co-author of Latvian Code of Good Corporate Governance Recommendations. And even beyond uh, recommendations uh, you go, you have drafted and uh, basically uh, implemented for Riga City municipal companies binding uh, regulations or recommendations. Give the number. Number four. Number four, right? So our president uh, once uh, basically uh, issued the regulation number two. You remember what it was. In the Riga City Council, everybody knows what is regulation number four. And it has really developed to the elevation of the corporate culture within the municipal companies. Andris, uh, your reflection uh, on the uh, topic, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Maris. And, and believe me, uh, we are cooperating in different formats. And I, I, I will have a chance to introduce you also in, okay, in the next agreed. event. So thank you for <laughs> kind words. And let me start with congratulations to uh, our Finance Latvia Association in first 30 years, in first successful uh, 30 years, and, and to kick off the G part of, of, of discussion uh, today. And uh, let me start with a context, because context is, uh, context is what influences our business environment. And I would like to emphasize three aspects when we are discussing ESG, and particularly uh, how the corporate governance role in this ESG concept and sustainability uh, is in, in, in our economy. And it's, it's no surprise that ESG is like an avalanche all over the place, and, and this is for staying. But what we see from the market and from the businesses, from the shareholders, and board and management perspective is that globally only half of the companies are integrating ESG aspects in their own strategies. In Latvia, the recent data was for the large entities, it's around 39% where we can find ESG-related uh, aspects, targets, KPIs, metrics, and activities. And uh, when we are Going in, into more depths uh, regarding business model of, of, of companies, there is 25%, so one fourth of the company who are actually actualizing and thinking how the business model looks from the ESG uh, lens. And also lack of incentives for ESG performance, so what is global discussion. So believe me or not, so this is corporate governance related aspects, how the shareholders, board of directors, and also management uh, board members and management teams are taking decision in a company. Is there a business case? So this is also what we heard in previous discussions today. Uh, so uh, global evidence shows that companies that are adhering to ESG principles and thinking and applying or, or embedding those uh, elements in a business strategy uh, is uh, reaching higher uh, financial performance. Also soft or intangible aspects like uh, uh, attracting or retaining talent. And it's amazing numbers that more than 70% global professionals uh, would accept a pay cut just to work for a company where we can share a mission, 
and share values, and where we can see the companies are driving to the road uh, for sustainable uh, future. And obviously resilience, the, the word that was mentioned several times during today, and how we can reduce the risk, and uh, how uh, Harvard Business Review a few years ago showed a uh, hard data, that companies that are really thinking about ESG and in, in, in incorporating those aspects in their business uh, models, uh, they are uh, much uh, resilient to different crises, uh, disruptions, uh, climate disasters, regulatory changes, and uh, other, uh, other items. And greenwashing. So I will not go in depth in this element, but, but more than 60% globally investors are naming the greenwashing or mar marketing ploy activities as a big challenge when they are deciding to invest in companies or not really. So, at the end of the day, what we, uh, how we can understand or how we can define, how we can un and, uh, go further with this G letter, what it actually is. And Maris mentioned Corporate Governance Code, and uh, is the title of the conference is related uh, to success stories. So, I, I would say that Latvian Corporate Governance Code that was approved a few years ago, and in audience there are persons and, uh, from, and organizations that are working very hard to draft the code, is the best in the Baltics and actually beyond with a modern approach, and when the European Commission is discussing how, what a new regulation regarding due diligence and sustainability and reporting, so, so Latvian corporate governance calls already is incorporating uh, those aspects there. Rules of the game, right? Agreement on the processes, agreement of the decision-making uh, uh, system, how the relationship framework among shareholders, uh, board of directors and management is, is organized in a company, and how to balance the conflicting interest of stakeholders of the company. So this would be, to put in a simple terms, what uh, we understand with a G letter in, in corporate governance, and that is applicable for small companies, medium-sized companies, large entities, and financial uh, sector uh, companies as well. So MSCA, what is a global example how we can tra uh, translate ESG in, in a pieces. Uh, actually, this governance part we can put in, in, in simple two dimensions. So I like to put in, uh, in two, two dimensions. So one is the fun part, most interesting part for shareholders and boards and managers. So how can we develop a company strategy, find a, a new uh, areas of development, what is our ambitious regarding that? We are talking here about the boards and board composition, how diverse boards are, what is the skill set there. And in the first part of the conference, if you remember the design on the screens, there was a calm Latin forest, right? And there was some trees. And uh, uh, when I was looking to those trees, I, I remember an old, old corporate joke regarding crow. And would you imagine on the tree, the bird crow is sitting and doing nothing. And the rabbit is, is going, and, and, and the rabbit saw the crow, and, and the rabbit is asking, what are you doing there? And the crow answers, I'm sitting and doing nothing. And the rabbit is saying, well, can I also sit and do nothing? So it, it sounds great. So this happened. So the rabbit was sitting, sitting, and suddenly the fox came and ate the rabbit. So the moral, uh, you should sit at the top and do nothing, like crow did. But such a board of directors who are sitting there without skill set, competence and diverse is something that we do not need in our business uh, environment. So strategic part was one dimension, but here comes the boring part, what most of the entrepreneurs are saying in, in our events. Compliance, risk governance, how the internal audit works, how we are evaluating our business partners, how we are managing sanctions, uh, what about internal control system in, in, in general? What about ethics? What about related party transactions? What about avoiding conflict of interest? So uh, this defense part is very important, like in the soccer game. So you need to attack and to, uh, to, get, to gain result, but you need also to defense a gate that can protect companies during a turbulent times, like COVID, like geopolitical challenges that we are facing uh, today with a Russian war in Ukraine and approaches uh, how we can adhere to the sanction regulation. And uh, Eva Tetter in the beginning told the tone from the top, and it's, it's, it was repeated several times afterwards, I would say that corporate governance is also very important with no unpleasant surprises. So both parts, 
strategic development and in this defense part is quite, uh, quite important. And uh, this is, yeah, here. And this is not only a theory, because from the Baltic Institute of Corporate Governance, we're running corporate governance assessment projects for, for a large Baltic uh, companies and group of the companies. And what we also see is this strategic development part uh, when the shareholders and boards and managers are trying to, to develop companies quite strong. Uh, but this control environment part, risk assessment, compliance, internal audit, uh, related party transactions is the weakest point currently, uh, reaching just in average 44% out of 100% of possible uh, score according to OECD and best corporate governance code. So, and uh, the answer is, so why we need, it's expensive. But uh, as what someone said once, if you think good corporate governance is expensive, try bad one. Try bad corporate governance and you'll see the consequences. So all over the, all over the place, the challenge for, for business leaders is how we can actually integrate uh, those ESG aspects in, in a backbone uh, of the company. And there are several uh, steps how, how to do, uh, and, and it's kind of holistic approach, and, and I guess when you will go through these eight points, what is on screen uh, currently, you will see that yes, we have done it, or we have partly done it, uh, by embedding ESG in a business process is okay, uh, allocating resources, so we discussed this today as well. What about targets? What about KPIs and metrics? How we are engaging uh, stakeholders? What about reporting? So how trustable, and how we are accountable to our stakeholders, and of course, uh, management of the risks. So uh, again, the G part, so it's very important that this is not only responsibility of the managers and, and communication managers and marketing persons, but goes uh, to the top uh, of the company. Therefore, a lot of uh, items what should be on board agenda, uh, starting from the uh, setting the strategic direction, how the risk management framework looks from the ESG lens, what about uh, policy update according to, to the le uh, latest trends, uh, how the uh, oversee and monitoring function is, is, is going on uh, regarding strategy and budget and KPI uh, implementation and so on and, and so forth. So what we can expect from the companies with a poor governance. And uh, Maris mentioned Riga City municipality, an uh, example with, where the financial underperformance is observed, legal and regulatory issues, high employee turnover, reduced shareholder value, and of course, uh, increased risks regarding fraud, or corruption, other type of misconduct. And uh, together with organizations, and including Finance Latvia Association, also uh, Foreign Investors Council, will build a new strategy and new uh, guiding uh, principles for that. But this is not only the, 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 the bad part of that. Also, uh, we cannot expect, if the governance is poor, that there will be some uh, great news regarding in investments or positive impact on environment, uh, employees, customers, shareholders, and also uh, stakeholders. But I, what I'd like to end uh, today is a, is a message that we also need to have a common understanding what is actually ESG. And there is investor demand for European Commission currently. Just define what actually sustainability means if you want board of directors to be involved in, in due diligence of, of, of sustainability. And if you have misaligned expectations, if you have inconsistent reporting in, in, in various jurisdictions, if you have lack of, uh, lack of standardization or no actual progress, so we'll not be happy. And these dogs in New York subway is a great example when there is a legislation and there was a case is when passengers complained about dogs who are entering the subway and scaring kids. And uh, New York, uh, started uh, a process of regulation and they agreed so you cannot take dogs in a subway unless they fit in a bag. And there was uh, quite an interesting story about what we can see there and afterwards a dispute when one guy uh, took a really large uh, dog in a barlap sack and there was a dispute be uh, between the employee of the uh, subway and, and the passenger is the barley sack a bag and there is a global or, uh, discussion about this phenomenon. So let's align expectations. Uh, let's uh, bring a clarity and whether it's soft or hard law, but the clarity is needed for us 
all. So thank you very much and have a fruitful discussions in upcoming panel discussions. <clears throat> Andres, great and insightful reflection, but when I was uh, listening to you and looking at our esteemed audience here, a question emerged. I would like to challenge you a little bit with that one. We have here um, many participants from the financial sector, right? They have, uh, they have resource, they have obviously departments. We heard uh, AML departments, risk departments. Uh, they now have ESG officers, ESG departments. But what about small and medium enterprises who have obviously less resource, kind of less time, but still they want to be and have to be compliant? Andris, what would be your uh, advice to the SME sector companies in the respect of bringing their G, but generally compliance, up to the standard? Yeah, so uh, I have experience with several <clears throat> family-owned businesses that want to start uh, corporate governance structuring process, and they are looking to some banks, and oh my God, you know this compliance, so this is not for us, or is governance, yeah. so it's, it's, it's a system since it's different and it's quite expensive IT tools and so on. Uh, but when you are going to each element of the government, step by step, by just saying that, okay, so if your turnover is 8 million euros or 4 million euros, so you need to understand what are risk in the market. You need to think about the CSG as well. Right. So you do not need to develop quite a, uh, uh, a difficult uh, or, or a comprehensive system, but you have a discussion when you have answers uh, to yourself how to develop, develop a business. You need a strategy on one page, not in 100 pages, but probably will be for, for larger uh, entities, and so on and so on. So corporate governance, main principle, it depends and it can be applicable to every size and every industry company, but you do not need to copy uh, the same structures and processes. And it is doable. Absolutely. Okay. So, um, let's give him a round of applause on this positive note. <laughs> Thank you, you Andris. Thank you very much. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I think uh, this is a moment that may many of you have been waiting for. Definitely, I have. We welcome on the stage Oliver Bullough, who is journalist and author of The Butler to the World and Moneyland and many other very interesting pieces uh, of writing. Oliver is a renowned British author. You have studied at the Oxford University, a real Oxford gentleman here, and you have been nominated for Orwell Prize for uh, Let Our Fame Be Great and for the Dolman Prize for The Last Man in Russia. Obviously, you get uh, the feeling that Oliver is an investigative journalist and expect no less that a daring, somewhat controversial, somewhat shocking presentation, but I think based on what I have learned, it's always facts-based. It's not just shocking, not just interesting, but it's a good base for the regulators also to adjust the uh, uh, certain, you know, procedures, rules, typologies, right? And that is a great contribution, the free press, the free world. Oliver, uh, your presentation on, bear muse me, how Western countries help the oligarchs loot Russia. What a title. Oliver, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marius. So I think Maris deserves some kind of award for the quality of his introductions. I've been <laughs> quite looking forward to what he was going to say about me. Um, I can't promise to be a perfect Oxford gentleman. Um, but what I'm going to do briefly is to take us all into a time machine back to the beginning of 1991 and the end of the Soviet Union. All the republics that emerged from the wreckage of the USSR faced serious challenges, but none of them faced challenges as serious as Russia did. Russia was not just trying to build a new political and economic system, but was also confronting the loss of an empire. 
and the loss of a place in the world, a position in the world, the role of superpower. And to be honest, most sensible people looking at that challenge would probably give up, walk away, say this isn't for me. But there was a small team of reformers in the Russian government who had a plan how to change their country for the better. And the plan went like this. They were aware that they only had a small window to operate in, so they wanted to get as much property out the door as they possibly could. They knew that the process would be flawed, that it might be unfair, but they felt that the benefits of this strategy vastly outweighed the potential downsides. And the reason for that was that the new class of property owners that they created, that new class of property owners would inevitably have disputes with each other. And in order to resolve those disputes, they would need free courts. So the new class of property owners would demand free, fair courts, and they would be the mechanism by which Russia gained an honest judiciary. Now, it isn't enough just to have an honest judiciary. You need to have an honest mechanism to implement the decisions of the judiciary so they would then become the mechanism to create a fair, honest state bodies and apparatus. And it isn't enough to have an honest judiciary if the laws themselves are not fair. So they would therefore also become the mechanism by which the laws would be adopted in a fair way and that that would lead to democracy. Free, uh, so property ownership, even if the process by which that property was gained was, was flawed and unfair, property ownership would become the fixed point by which this small band of reformers intended to build capitalism and democracy in Russia. It is easy now, knowing as we do, that the plan failed, and failed disastrously, that Russia is nothing like they dreamt that it would be, that, that the idealists dreamt it would be in the early 1990s. It is easy now to criticize the plan. But I'm not sure that the plan was actually bad, because the route which they thought Russia would follow, a route from authoritarianism via private property for some, to free courts, to limited democracy, to full democracy, is exactly the same route that my own country took. That is how Britain built democracy after all. No, I think the reason that the plan failed is different and considerably more troubling. The reason was that if you were one of that class of property owners inside Russia, you had another option open to you. You didn't have to do all that laborious work building democracy that the reformers imagined that they would do. Now, I've spoken to the estate agent who, in the third week of January 1991, sold three apartments to a Russian in London in what appears to have been the first sale of any property in London to a Russian purchaser. Certainly, first sale after the revolution. Within a year, Russians coming to London with bags of money to buy property was so commonplace that it had become a national joke. We all talked about it, these barbarians from the East turning up with their grubby dollars and buying anything that wasn't nailed down. I am part of a team, um, a small group of idiots, who runs what we call the kleptocracy tours in London. We start on the banks of the River Thames, where we admire the duplex apartment belonging to Igor Shuvalov, former Russian deputy prime minister, close confidant of Vladimir Putin's. We then drive in a bus via property belonging to Oleg Deripaska, Roman Abramovich, uh, Vladimir Yakunin, former neighbor and fellow KGB agent of Putin's, and up into Highgate, where we, we stop at Wittenhurst, the second largest house in London after Buckingham Palace, where the king lives. And London is not the only place where the Russians put their money. They bought property in the south of France. They bought property, property in Switzerland. They bought super yachts, super yachts after super yachts after super yachts. So much money poured out of Russia that Russia is unique among large economies for having more than half of its national wealth held outside the country. 51%, according to the estimate of Gabriel Zuckman, an academic at the University of Berkeley, California, who is an expert in the offshore world. The equivalent for a European country is about 10%. The equivalent for the United States is about four. And what did this mean for the plan, for this intention of building democracy in Russia? It meant that the oligarchs didn't need to build free courts and, free and fair police services and fair elections at home. They could buy all of that abroad. They got free courts in Switzerland, in the US, in the UK and elsewhere. They got the rule of law for their ownership of their super yachts thanks to the tax havens in the Caribbean, in Cyprus and elsewhere. The offshore world made up for what the Russian oligarchs were not prepared to build at home. And that meant that that class of property owners did not become the vanguard of democracy. 
they became something else, the vanguard of kleptocracy. Because if they could buy property rights abroad, their role in Russia changed completely. They became looters, colonizers of their own country, people who would steal as much as they can, secure in the knowledge that if they got it out of Russia, it was safe, and it was safe with the best property rights that money could buy. Now, obviously, what's happened in Russia is the oligarch's fault. We can't absolve them of responsibility for having stolen everything that they've stolen. But we need to bear our share of responsibility too. By providing them with those services, offshore services, we allowed them to transform themselves into kleptocrats. And also we allowed them to sit out politics in Russia because they knew that the decisions that Putin took didn't really affect them. Their assets were safe overseas. So if Putin did something idiotic, whatever. It wasn't their business. They could just keep stealing and they could do, keep that deal that Putin made with Mikhail Horokovsky back in 2003, that if they stayed out of politics, he would stay out of business. Um, obviously, it turned out that that was a bad plan from the oligarchs' perspective. Putin eventually behaved so outrageously with what he did to Ukraine that the oligarchs' wealth was sanctioned. And we often talk about the fact that, for example, in the UK, $18 billion worth of oligarchs' wealth has been sanctioned. That isn't a success. That is a sign of our past failure. The fact that there was $18 billion worth of sanctionable wealth in our economy is a sign of how badly we behaved in the past. And that is why anti-money laundering rules and regulations and procedures are so important. That, because if we had never allowed this money into our economies in the first place, then this class of rapacious kleptocrats would never have appeared. Kleptocracy relies on the offshore world and offshore services to be created. So all of the checks that, have been, that are now happening in banks on oligarchs' wealth, yes, they're better late than never, but they will hopefully prevent new oligarchs from being created and the kleptocracy in Russia from getting even worse. Now, I admit, um, had someone told me five years ago that I would be speaking at a conference in Latvia about how, how well it was doing in tackling money laundering, I would have been surprised. Latvia's reputation was not good. This is something which you're all aware of. Latvia shares part of the responsibility, not as much as the UK, but part of the responsibility for what happened in Russia. And I congratulate you on the progress that you've made. It's absolutely fantastic. It's been difficult. I appreciate that. And I know there are many people now um, who object, think perhaps you've gone too far with the de-risking and perhaps you need to dial it back a little bit, perhaps to lend more money to the economy, as one of the distinguished guests mentioned earlier. Um, <laughs> said to be controversial. Um, now, after I've congratulated you, I want to tell you that I have bad news. Because anti-money laundering excellence is not an outcome, it's a process. It's a bit like getting fit. Yes, if you've been lying around on the couch for 20 years and you weigh 30 kilos and you lose your 30 kilos and you get up and run a marathon, that's great. But if you're fighting money laundering, you need to keep doing that every week. You're going to need to keep working out. You're going to need to keep going, to the, you know, going out to the park and running round and round. You need to keep staying fit all the time. That's bad. But the worst bit is worse, which is that in the Western economy, we live in a house with 100 doors. And it isn't enough to guard one of those doors. Because if the dirty money can just go round through one of the many other 99 doors, then all the guarding that you're doing is essentially achieving nothing. So what I would like you to do now is be enthusiastic. Be that annoying person who won't stop going on about something that interests them that everyone wishes that they shut up about. Heaven knows it's what I do with my life. Go on and on and on about how important compliance is and how important anti-money laundering is. Because if you guys can do it, anyone can do it. And wouldn't it be great if in five years' time I was at a conference just like this in Malta, and five years after that in Cyprus. And then who knows, maybe in 10 or 15 years we'll have the problem solved. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> Controversial enough? Thank you so much, uh, <laughs> Oliver. Don't leave the stage. When I was um, listening to this uh, great presentation, so today we are celebrating that Latvia has fulfilled uh, 40 FATF uh, recommendations 
all of that. But listening to you, what do you think? Is it enough or can, for, uh, to tackle the issues, to tackle the uh, oligarchs looting uh, basically um, the countries, to tackle those risks? Are those 40 enough or countries should do more? How, how long and if they should do more, what? How long have we got? Uh, well, we have, um, we have, you know, uh, the, 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 Listen, the quick, the executive summary of executive summary. No, no, you, yeah. you can only start from the place where you are, right? Yeah. So obviously, the 40 principles is, is the place to start once right. you've done that. But that's, you know, the entry level. Yeah. After that, it's a question of, you know, you've been talking about ESG. Yeah, those are not FATF guidelines. Those are voluntary things. But you can look and say, you know, what do we want to happen? Because the downside of getting this wrong is Ukraine right now. Yes. That's what happens if you get money laundering policy wrong. And Europe as a civilization, the West as a civilization, got it wrong. We right. got into bed with some of the worst people that there are because it was profitable for us and the rest of us couldn't be bothered to do anything about it for too long. We so got it wrong, but we are now getting it right back. We are getting it right in relation to Russia, I think, and in relation to Belarus. But there are a lot of kleptocracies yeah. out there. And I, don't, I do not believe that we are getting it right in relation to them. I think that at the moment our response has been too focused on sanctions and too little focused on building up our law enforcement apparatus. Mm -hmm. And two, you know, we need to look at this as a national security threat and resource it as thoroughly as we resourced the effort against terrorism after 9-11. That's the, the, the level of effort that's right. required and it needs to be sustained. So right. we're not anywhere near there yet. But I would say the glass is 10% full. Right. So uh, the, the resourcing the law enforcement uh, sufficiently to uh, constantly elevate professionalism, that is a structural uh, thing that you basically say. Yeah, I, I think all across Europe, right. you know, including the UK, we are all bad at this. The, U the US is good at the enforcement. It's not so good on the transparency stuff, but it's very good on the enforcement. Yep. We are better at transparency terrible in enforcement. Mm. Um, if we could just combine the, the EU stroke UK approach and the US approach and not make the worst of both worlds, but instead make the best of both worlds, US enforcement in EU transparency, then we'd be doing much, much better. That's what I would love to see. Thank you for your reflections. Although enforcement is also really picking up uh, speed in Latvia, that's for sure. Good. I'm Thank you. to hear it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for... Right. So after Oliver, we have a fantastic panel discussion now coming up. Um, yes. On the topic of how good governance helps in the challenging era of sanctions, why and how businesses and society benefits. And this discussion will be led by the moderator, Samuel Cousins, who is Senior Associate at Ransomware and Risk at ACAMS. So welcome, Samuel, and uh, you're also, uh, you've got excellent education from the University of Nottingham with experience in sanctions policy team at UK Finance and NATO's Center for Excellence for Defense Against Terrorism. Uh, you also enhance the industry awareness of the uh, financial crime risks associated with ransomware attacks and supporting the mitigation of those risks through policies, training and public and private dialogue. That is very contemporary, that is very relevant. Thank you for the job that you're doing, but you will have a great panel of uh, speakers to talk with. First, it's Paulis Ilyenkovs, the Head of Strategic Analysis Division at Financial Intelligence Unit of Latvia. We will have the business representative, Mr. Pauls Abele, who is board member at Latvia's Finiaris, extremely um, you know, high reputation Latvian company, adds a lot to our exports. Welcome on the stage, Pauls. And we will have Siri Grabbi, Sanctions Officer at Coop Pank, AS Estonia. So, Sam, the panel is in your hands.
Thank you very much, and thanks, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, luckily, the introduction's already taken care of, so I think we can uh, crack on and get into this. We do have a slightly compressed panel, so we're going to try and get 45 minutes of content into 22 minutes. So we'll see how we get on, but we will finish on time. Um, so just for a bit of context, we're talking about, obviously, sanctions governance and how and why society benefit. And over the past year, this has become more important than ever. We've obviously seen, since the invasion of Ukraine, wide-scale sanctions across the G7 and, indeed, other partners. We've seen thousands of designations, massive export control lists, vast waves of sectors impacted, and a number of novel restrictions, including oil price cap and others. And, of course, Latvia, and indeed the uh, wider Baltics, is really on the front line of sanctions implementation. So it's really great to be here and talking to uh, experts based in the region. So without further ado, um, if I could start us off with talking about why governance is so important in the context of sanctions. And Siri, I'll turn it over to you, given your previous diplomatic experience. Well, <clears throat> why sanctions matter? Yeah, I as a diplomat uh, or former diplomat, I would say that many people see sanctions as just uh, a diplomatic tool to uh, gain or regain peace and so on and so on and so on. But it's actually our everyday life, uh, life that is uh, affected of, that, of us. Yes, of course, we do have sanctions coming in from Brussels, uh, from uh, Washington, uh, D.C., that we all have to follow and, and they seem uh, as a burden to us, and we have to have some sort of governance in place, minimally screen maybe uh, the names in the financial sector, but actually it is the benefit for all of us. It is the law for all of us to follow the sanctions, to have the sanctions governance in place. It's actually our job, uh, not the, the polit politicians or diplomats' job, to bring the peace and security back. The longer uh, we stall with actually implementing sanctions, actually having uh, the systems in place, the governance in place. The longer we live in the agony, the longer we have uh, Russia as a neighbor, as we have at the moment. Um, the more our economic system is in instable uh, stage, uh, we don't have any investors coming in in fear of uh, Russia and so on. But at the same time, uh, big companies as well, they would have to understand and see that it's, it's not okay actually to give bribe to somebody in Syria like ISIS uh, for having their um, economic benefits uh, for just a short period of time. In the end, we all suffer from having um, uh, Russia as it is, uh, Syria um, with its uh, terrorist cells, uh, and not only the political uh, situation, but also North Korea, Iran, we all have to uh, put our efforts to achieve the peace, which is good in the end for all of us. Thanks, Siri. And of course, there's a number of uh, financial, legal, and reputational risks alongside that. Paulis, Pauls, would you have any further comments on this? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, uh, Sam. And thank you, Siri. Completely agree with everything you said. I think uh, that is a fundamental and undebatable issue that complying with sanctions by regular businesses, by financial institutions, inevitably contributes to the attainment of international peace and security, the objectives of the European Union sanctions. That is undebatable. Legal scholars in international law say that sanctions is the perfect middle ground between war just words on the one hand, which would not be enough, answer to Russian invasion of Ukraine. And on the other spectrum, we have war, which would cost every one of us much, much more. Therefore, sanctions is the perfect middle ground, and compliance with them inevitably impacts, uh, in a positive way, the whole society, because it attains international peace and security. However, we are talking about financial institutions and regular businesses, and uh, it is also a fact that sanctions do not only impose economic harm on the target of sanctions, in this case, the Russian government and Russia more broadly, but also on those who impose sanctions, because sanctions must be compliant with it, and it may come with a cost. Obviously, it is a cost, but it's a cost that uh, must be paid in order to attain international peace and security. What is the benefit for businesses and financial institutions? In my opinion, there are many. We can start with the reputational one. There is a 
uh, legal risk of non-compliance with sanctions. There can be criminal liability, administrative liability, and financial risk of non-complying with sanctions. Uh, obviously, we have heard of uh, hefty fines imposed by, for example, OFAC against certain financial institutions for non-compliance with sanctions uh, in billions of uh, US dollars. And uh, I would also say that there is an existential risk to non-compliance with sanctions, and we have had cases of that. Even in Latvia, one particular bank, which was accused of alleged sanctions violations, uh, after those allegations ceased to operate after a while. And uh, there have been even court judgments on that in Helsinki District Court. About five years ago, one of Russian oligarchs uh, uh, sued a couple of Finnish banks for not uh, operating, executing his transactions, because those banks were complying with the United States sanctions. And the court said, yes, the bank had every right to comply even with American sanctions, uh, because those, uh, the non-compliance could lead to uh, existential risk of that bank, to liquidity problems, to capital requirements problems. And that brings me back to what uh, Ms. Cherna Mejmala said in the first panel today about uh, the inevitable correlation between compliance on the one hand and all the other requirements that banks must abide by, prudential requirements, capital requirements, liquidity requirements. Even if you are perfectly good on all of these prudential requirements, non-compliance with sanctions, with anti-money laundering can have very strong repercussions. Therefore, sanctions compliance benefits the businesses and financial institutions, both from a fundamental philosophical perspective and from operational perspective. Very clearly laid out. Thank you, Paulus. Uh, mindful of, of time, and we've got a few things that we want to get onto, but Pauls, I'll give you a quick opportunity. Any quick comments you'd want to make uh, on this question as well? Yeah, I totally agree to what you, you, what you said, that sanctions, it's not a business only of politicians and banks, it's our, our business. And therefore, I'm very thankful for inviting uh, forestry and, and woodworking experience and, 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 and experience we, we, we have. So, and I, I would like to add that um, it's very big time of opportunities. The sanctions, again, open eyes what Russia is, what Belarus is, and, and just, just some, some examples. So now it's good good time to switch from uh, gas for he heating to biomass. So in Latvia and Europe, we have enough Biomass and our, our company have switched, started switching, switching from gas to biomass 20 years ago, and now close to 90% of our heat is generated from lo local resources. So we are quite a big user of uh, fossil chemicals like phenol, formaldehyde, and so on. And, and till, till the war, we were still using some Russian chemicals, but uh, we need just, just one day to make a decision and, and not to purchase any, anything from Russia. So it's a question of making a decision and being able to make a decision to bit suffer, but to, uh, but, but to gain in a long, long run. And one thing to, to add about context, about we are plywood company. We are world's leading plywood company. And our big competitors are in Russia, and those are owned by oligarch Mr. Mordashov. And 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 we know if Europe and now plywood is sanctioned, and if Europe was continuing purchasing plywood from Russia, so we know where the money was was moving. And during last, I don't know even how how many years, so plywood. European plywood industry was quite suffering from competition, and I would say unfair competition from Russia, because Russian oligarchs and plywood producers have, have been having unfair uh, support from the state, and it was, uh, uh, it, it was say, found out by European com Commission, and before, even before starting sanctions, Russian plywood was Tax, taxified by by Europe, and now it's a good 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 time not to forget what what Russia is. And during last two three years, so some plywood production was closed in Finland, 
in Poland just because of unfair competition. And now it's a good time to recover and to have much more industry back in Europe. Thank you, Paul. So we've dealt with why it, why it benefits business and society, but let's really get into that, that G element here, governance, and what makes good governance when it comes to sanctions. And uh, Paulus, I'll turn to you first on this. Now, we have the OFAC compliance commitments, for example, uh, which is a framework for you know, the, the essential elements of a sanctions compliance program. That's for the US context, but it's very useful to look at elsewhere. So I'll, I'll turn it over to you to talk to that. Yes, thank you. Uh, the role of governance and sanctions compliance, absolutely very important, as stated in uh, CGSS, Certified Global Sanctions Compliance Handbook, written by ACAMS. There's a whole topic on how important governance is uh, and how it should be framed in, for example, financial institutions with three lines of defense and, and the commitment from the board of directors. But I think, again, I shouldn't reinvent the, the wheel. Uh, there are OFAC compliance commitments, and I think uh, good governance is perfectly embodied in the OFAC compliance commitments that can also be borrowed by uh, European uh, businesses and financial institutions, especially those that work on uh, cross-border bases, and especially if they have historically worked with Russia or in sectors that have been uh, sanctioned by the European Union or the United States uh, for, uh, for trading with Russia. So uh, basically, the five main elements of proper governance and sanctions compliance is number one, something we have talked about today quite a lot, is management commitment. We can call it tone from the top. If there is no management commitment for sanctions compliance, uh, sanctions governance will not work properly. The sanctions compliance program will inevitably fail. Number two is risk assessment. Everybody has different risks. There is no one-size-fits-all approach. The principles might be the same against about the three lines of defense, but there is no one-size-fits-all approach. You must understand your risks, your customers, geographies you work in, your delivery channels, and so forth. We all know about uh, the main components of the risk assessment. Number three, proper internal controls. Uh, there must be uh, independence of the compliance function. Uh, they cannot be overridden by uh, shady business interests sometimes. Number four, testing and auditing of those internal controls. And number five, obviously training of all employees, because we might talk about enforcement today as well, but, and there hasn't been a lot of enforcement in the European Union, but when we look at the enforcement actions in the United States, which has plenty of experience, sometimes it is uh, a work of one particular individual in the company who is not particularly supervised uh, that has carried out an action that the whole firm has to pay for, which amounted to sanctions violation. That's why the fifth element, training of all employees on sanctions related matters, is very important. Unfortunately, we have to talk about it as much because of Russia related sanctions, because of what Russia is doing. If we talk about it three years ago, maybe it wouldn't be so pressing because Latvia was not exposed to such high risks as it is today. Um, but it is what it is. So these are the five top elements that need to be taken into account and based on the particular business that a company is involved in, uh, they might take one or different shape. But without management commitment and tone from the top, no good sanctions governance can happen. Thanks, Paulus. So Siri, you work in a financial institution. From, from your perspective, you know, what would you have to add on to that? Is there any elements you'd want to maybe delve into a little deeper? For example, a scenario where there's a sanctioned individual or there's a breach, you know, what are the key governance principles that need to be in place? Yeah, well, um, basically, Polis has uh, anyway stolen all my words already, but uh, what I would uh, like to emphasize is uh, really in, in, in the practical case where you discover that you have maybe a sanctioned entity or uh, an entity owned by a sanctioned per person in your portfolio is that you need to have a chain of command in place as well. Who does what and when? And uh, if, if you don't have that in place, everybody will run around like headless chickens and in the end the assets will be fled out before you can actu actually freeze them or, um, <clears throat> uh, well, in the end you, you will have the consequences of that as well, that uh, you get the uh, penalties uh, uh, that affects the general financial system. Uh, of your country, not, not only your bank, but as well the, the whole repetition of the banking system will get hit because 
if uh, one bank is already in such bad condition that they cannot even discover su uh, subject to sanctions, then uh, probably the rest of the system is similar. And we have really seen it that uh, with the uh, recent cases as well uh, in, in Baltics, uh, that uh, if one bank gets a black mark on them, we all suffer. Not only Latvia, not only Estonia, uh, not only Lithuania, but we all, are all seen as one uh, region. And uh, I can only say that Latvia has done a really, really great job uh, being in the green. I'm often looking at the reports written by Paulis and, and his colleagues to learn from them. Uh, myself and uh, then probably the last point I want to emphasize here as well in the governance is the, is the good cooperation between uh, financial institutions but also private sector in general and the public sector where Latvia definitely is a good example. Thanks, Siri. So I think it's, it's fair to say as well that one of the, the key focuses of, of not just the EU, but other, other G7 partners and, and indeed other jurisdictions is an increasing focus on, for example, sanctions of Asia. And we're seeing uh, lots of different uh, techniques and typologies being used. FIU Latvia put out a very helpful um, uh, assessment of those typologies previously. Um, Pauls, I know you probably have some comments you'd like to make about what makes good sanctions governance, but keeping in mind the time, I might ask you to weave any comments you have on that into a case study right. that you could give us uh, as well if you have anything to add. But could you give us a case study of some of the sort of trade patterns or trends or typologies that you're seeing when it comes to yeah. sanctions? Before I will spend 20, 20, 20 seconds on, on, on saying that we have uh, our company, those compliance systems, and we're checking our suppliers and, and customers. And, but I, I ask myself and all of us to think in a, in a long term and to give an answer. Is Russia and Belarus our long-term partners in five years, 10 years, 50 years? Because we are, when we are developing business, so it's important what is it? cooperation and, and my answer is may, may, maybe not so, and our company is not building business with, with that but about case, case studies yeah I'm very thankful to banking industry which brought uh, this word sanctions uh, 10 years ago to my mind and to our board board table and we have developed our sanction compliance system and we have uh, we, we have we are using is it database equity and, and it's implemented in our ERP and it spends only half full-time equivalent. So it, if, if we are interested, then it's po possible to, to make a good, good efficient system. And, and one, 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 one example of good cooperation with commercial banks, so we check. So if we start uh, cooperation with new customer, for instance, in Turkey, we check. All, all, all of them, and uh, that was real, real case. So we started sales, and, and when money was coming in, Seb Bank was asking, "So how we checked?" And yeah, we show. So everything is checked, everything is clear. But Seb so, somehow brought more information that maybe this customer is selling further to Iran. So and and, and yes, we did not have any more business with this customer. But we had money because we we checked uh, in, uh, we checked this new customer in line with all, all our, our requirements. So it's very very important to have this this close cooperation with with the banks because you you are using not only equity but ten systems and much more. We have only half percent doing that. And another uh, example what what we are doing as a company and as an industry. So we are plywood experts and all of us know that. So Russian ply was is sanctioned, sanctioned, and but main market was Europe, and, and there are efforts to bring plywood to, to Europe through Turkey, through Kazakhstan, through Kyrgyzstan, and we know that before the war there were only two companies in Kazakhstan producing very small amount of, of plywood, and now we see that there are 60 companies, and, and, and I, I cannot believe that banks or, or tax authorities or customs of Latvia and Europe may know all of that, and it's our, our duty to collect this information and, and to feed, and, and we are doing that to banks, to, 
uh, customs and tax authorities, and that uh, is a good, good cooperation, and that gives a possibility to bring balance back and to have the same, uh, say, same competition for every, everybody in the market. So, thank you, Paul. Um, so we've got three three minutes left, and uh, I wonder if we have time to just maybe talk about one other case study very quickly, and maybe wider enforcement trends. Siri, would you have any comments to make? Um, yes, uh, we recently had a case, or kind of the Estonian uh, media as well picked up a case where. Um, OFAC sanctions uh, were violated by an Estonian company and uh, there was actually a big judiciary, co judiciary cooperation between uh, Latvian, Estonian authorities and the US authorities where uh, it began with uh, first a, um, a Maltese company actually um, uh, invading uh, OFAC sanctions and uh, getting all sorts of uh, military equipment through this uh, company to Russia. And uh, in, uh, it, it was then uh, last year, last summer, uh, one Estonian resident and two Latvian residents were arrested for trying to smuggle um, a certain machine, something that cuts um, uh, s some pieces. I don't. I don't even know how to explain that. But um, uh, well, it, it is a dual-use item for uh, nuclear purposes, and, and uh, they tried to transport it um, to Russia. But of course, it, it failed. They were uh, caught before. Uh, they are still under trial in the US, but uh, there was an Estonian company as well related to one of those uh, persons, to the uh, Estonian resident, actually um, Ukrainian citizen. So don't think that a citizenship or origin matters if you want to evade sanctions. If, if you only see the uh, dollar numbers in front of your eyes, then uh, you, don't, you don't actually care what, uh, what is going on around you. And now this Estonian company, uh, um, uh, by trade, is under sanctions as well. And this is something that actually banks would have seen, that there's something strange going on on the uh, accounts because First of all, there, there were basically no funds going through the account, but all of a the sudden the revenues were over one and a half million euros. So, yes, this is one of the cases uh, that has been uh, under Estonian attention recently with the OFAC sanction evasion. Thank you, Siri. As much as I'd love to discuss that more, I'm afraid, unfortunately, that's all we have time for. Um, sanctions is quite a big topic, so thank you to my panelists for uh, whizzing through that quite quickly, given the time that we had. But um, I hope that you found it useful, and, and thank you very much to the panel for, for joining me for this discussion. Thank you so much, Sam. Paul, spouse, Siri, you did fantastically well within the time allowed. It was really a real content, wasn't it? And it was very energetic. And uh, Siri, where are you? Thank you so much. You know, we have this Latvian Estonian thing a little bit, but to, to hear <laughs> from Estonian that uh, so good words about uh, Latvia's, uh, you know, successes. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. So, um, but my main takeaway, uh, hearing your. Um, your um, case studies and your reflections is that a well-functioning and properly set up corporate governance in a uh, corporate entity, it is so import important in curbing evasion, non-compliance, misrepresentations, all of that. So it's actually extremely fundamental in the interests of the own business its shareholders and stakeholders more generally. Thank again uh, the, the wonderful panel. On the topic of available tools for bettering AML and ESG, and the big question, is it worth it? 
OK. And since you have coming back from the already like third break, we will need to find a little bit, you know, to, uh, to another task, right? Two, I'm, I'm sure you are awake, but we need to make sure you are awake. Therefore, there will be now possibility to submit through Slido questions to the speakers. There will be on the screen, um, soon to appear, the code for scanning of the Slido platform. You all know how to use it. And there will be the code, right, where to dial in. And the questions will be incoming on my nice tablet here. And uh, of course, as a lawyer, I must say, to the extent reasonably possible, I will ask those questions then to the speakers. So that is about this session. And with much honor, I would like to welcome the first speaker, Mr. Yehuda Schaefer. He is former deputy state attorney, or I should say uh, attorney general or prosecutor general, and the head of FIU Israel, currently independent consultant. But Yehuda, you are a Harvard graduate, I gather and a real expert in AML CFT matters by conducting risk assessments and providing assistance on operational and legal issues related to the money laundering prevention and sanctions um, non-compliance prevention. So uh, Yehuda, you are a real friend and ally to Latvia. How many times do you think Yehuda has been to Latvia? <laughs> We're talking about compliance with 40 recommendations, <laughs> and that is about the number that Yehuda has come to. Is that right? Something like that. That is something about that, a visit per a recommendation. So uh, we are really uh, looking forward to your reflections how Latvia achieved compliance with all those 40 recommendations with your kind help. Yehuda. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's indeed a pleasure and an honor to be speaking here today. So I thank the organizers for inviting me. I've been asked to give a lecture actually on the topic of the day, uh, which is from great to green, how Latvia achieved compliance with all 40 recommendations, title being slightly misleading because there's no real full compliance and there's no real green when it comes to these issues. In fact, uh, as uh, Oliver mentioned uh, before me, I think any, all of you in the room who are, uh, I assume, uh, engaged in, in uh, professions involved in anti-money laundering, anybody involved in anti-money laundering has job security. Uh, this problem is not going anywhere and by its nature, any uh, any um, loophole that is closed, immediately there's a new loophole uh, being opened because criminals uh, are in there for a, a lucrative motive. They want to make the money, they want to make the profit, and they will always find how. So trying to answer the question, how did Latvia avoid the gray listing and how uh, Latvia did this so well, we have to give some background about the uh, FATF and the gray listing uh, process. And actually, the, the, the whole uh, system of gray listing and the whole FATF methodology, I think, as uh, Immanuel Kant, the German philosopher, said, uh, there is nothing more practical than a good theory. And I think this uh, methodology of FATF, in my view, has been uh, an extremely uh, useful and, and good theory and very practical. And this whole process of use of soft power, because this is not convention, this is not uh, law, this is just threatening to gray list, to, to uh, blacklist countries, has motivated uh, jurisdictions to actually make a change. Uh, recent research that just came out last week shows that gray listing has a very, very different impact on various economies and hits harder on underdeveloped countries. But for some countries like my own, like Israel, 
it was the only thing that actually got Israel to do something against money laundering. And I've seen this in other jurisdictions, including uh, Latvia, where external pressure is needed because money laundering is not prioritized. Money laundering is not prioritized because of its uh, transnational element and because um, it does not affect, it does not primarily affect victims in the country. It primarily affects processes and victims outside of the country, and therefore, in the natural course of things, will never be prioritized by police and by uh, prosecution and by uh, law enforcement because there's always more urgent things to do. Um, now, in applying this gray listing and this soft power, I think we, we've all learned some counterintuitive lessons, uh, both in Israel, Latvia, Malta, and various other jurisdictions I work in. Uh, and I think that is, first of all, that AML is good for business, not bad for business. It's not against business because it protects and maintains the integrity of the financial system. We've all seen, including in this country, what happens to banks that get infected uh, by money laundering. And bad money has a negative effect on uh, economies. Uh, I can give, for example, inflated uh, real estate prices in Tel Aviv, in London, and in Yermola as well. Yeah? So um, this, this, these kind of financial flows have their negative uh, uh, consequences and externalities. Um, what countries learn in counterintuitively is that the big money is not the black money. The big money is the good money. The investment money uh, that comes into countries is attracted by, uh, is attracted to clean and stable economies that have uh, transparency, good regulation, and the rule of law. And it took me, uh, in my own country, in Israel, it took me quite a bit of time to convince uh, legislators and lawmakers of this because there are many myths around this and I think perhaps in Latvia as well there is some uh, mythology around uh, such notions that uh, the big money is actually black money and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Now the background of Latvia's mutual valuation report, it was the, the report was in 2017. In 2018 the Manival adopted the, the, the report and then an observation period uh, ended in 2019 uh, and between those between those dates, in February 13th, 2018, came the famous FinCEN advisory naming Bank ABLV uh, an institution of primary money laundering concern and purpose uh, under Section 311, uh, finding, they claim, that the bank orchestrates money laundering schemes, obstructs regulatory enforcement, and has conduct activity linked to North Korea, uh, which was an extremely uh, powerful uh, tool used by, 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 Manivel, by uh, uh, FinCEN. And so altogether, Latvia actually had one year to demonstrate substantial progress in the action plan in the, uh, and rectify what was found uh, to be uh, deficient. And when we speak about deficiencies, we don't, we don't, we're not speaking about the 40 recommendations so much, because Latvia today, by the way, is one of the two European countries uh, so I think Latvia and Malta are the only countries in, uh, in Europe and in Manival that have all their recommendations either largely compliant or compliant. Most, most countries still have a few uh, problems with technical compliance, but technical compliance is not what it's all about. It's about effectiveness. And for those of you who know the methodology, there are 11 immediate outcomes, and, and Latvia failed 10 out of 11. So apart from IO2, international cooperation, uh, Latvia failed all other 10 with the IO5 and IO11 uh, so IO5 is about uh, beneficial ownership and IO11 is about uh, proliferation financing. So those two totally failed low and all the rest were uh, moderate, which is a, uh, also a failing uh, mark. And this, of course, uh, got Latvia into potentially going to the gray list. And Latvia had one year to uh, get its act together and actually demonstrate effectiveness. And when we say demonstrate effectiveness, we're talking about actual supervision, actual sanctions, actual investigations, actual prosecutions, actual conf confiscations, actual, which sounds almost impossible to do in one year. And actually, many countries uh, have failed uh, to, to, to do, make substantial progress in one year and have actually uh, gone into the gray list. Uh, such as, for instance, another client of mine, Malta, which uh, went in for one year and then got out. And there are other countries that I'm working with who are still in the gray list for, for a long period. Um, so this is quite an achievement for Latvia um, to get, not to avoid this list and to actually not only fix this law or that law, but actually ob uh, obtain actual results within one year. So how was this achieved? And this is what I've been asked to talk about, so I'll try and, and uh, I try to remember some, some moments 
in this process that I was part of. And, and here are some, some of my observations. So the first thing is political will. I can't forget the a meeting which I had, uh, which I was part of uh, at the Prime Minister's office, in the Prime Minister's uh, office, and actually two organizations were quarreling about some issue, which I, we can leave now, we don't have to describe the, the details, but this ended with the Prime Minister banging on the table and saying, you're going out now and you're coming back in three hours after this problem has been solved. So obviously the leadership of the highest level of caring about money laundering and uh, promoting this was, was essential. We don't see this in, in many jurisdictions. So this is actually the advantage of the FATF and its process that it brings the focus of AML issues, it brings to, to, the, to the highest levels. Uh, and the fear of, the, of, the, the fear of uh, gray listing and uh, uh, the, the detrimental effects it might have on the economy get politicians interested. But there, there was definitely political will. The second uh, element I would say is the improved risk understanding. So this is again not about the technical compliance of, of legislating this or that, but it's about the strategic analysis uh, products that the FIU was producing, the whole understanding of uh, the banks and the supervisors of the risk of foreign uh, automobile beneficial owners. So th there's actually no inherent problem with having a risk appetite to include uh, foreign jurisdiction uh, UBOs, but if you do that, you need to uh, have in place mitigating measures a company to, 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 to deal with this, which I think Latvia did not have when it uh, onboarded all these foreign clients, and uh, therefore a, a de-risking attempt of, of uh, uh, minimizing this, this risk was, 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 uh, was taken on board and it was very effective. And of course, improving the risks and the risk understanding, again, through these documents that the FIU was doing on terror financing, on non-profit organizations, on legal persons. So uh, risk understanding was, was key here. Um, this was a national process, so there was uh, there are a few words I wrote down remembering what, what I saw, like spirit of cooperation between the various uh, uh, um, entities and uh, with the private sector proactiveness, so not waiting for, for things to happen, but actually taking, uh, being proactive and of course maintaining the momentum and, and uh, uh, keeping uh, the coordination between, uh, between uh, entities. It's not trivial. So you're the private sector here, and you, I'm sure you look critically at government. Uh, I can tell you from someone who works in many, many small jurisdictions, sometimes the smaller ju the jurisdiction is, the less cooperation there is between the agencies. And here, actually, in Latvia, there was a really good spirit of cooperation, uh, and uh, they, they should be commenced. The, <clears throat> a major point here is the FIU leadership, uh, at the time by uh, Ilza Znotina, my good friend. Um, this leadership, by the FIU on this topic is not because the FIU is the most important uh, body in the world, but it happens in most countries. Every other organization, the supervisors, the law enforcement, the, uh, anybody, everybody else have many other issues on their plate. The only institution that has only money laundering, anti-money laundering on their plate is the FIU. And therefore, the FIU has a, a leadership role here, and I think they, they did their role uh, in a very uh, commensable way. Uh, there were the scandals we mentioned, were taken as by, law, by the FIU and by police as an opportunity to demonstrate effectiveness, to actually take action. And actual results were, were actually achieved by a paradigm shift at the prosecution and the judiciary. And I think they need to be commenced as well because starting to focus on standalone money laundering. Standalone money laundering is when you prosecute money laundering without prosecuting the predicate offender because the predicate offense is abroad. So we have several such prosecutions that's not, been not easy to, to be done, to be achieved by the prosecutors and by the judges. The uh, non-conviction based uh, confiscations, all these are a very um, um, high level uh, challenging uh, issues to be, to be handled by prosecution services around the world and they were done very professionally here in, in Latvia. And I, I think I need to say that one of the things that uh, was very apparent in Malta, in, in Latvia, is that this was all done by local, most of this was done by local professionals. professionals. So as a consultant, I know some countries come to you and they want to prepare us a document, write us the in our national risk assessment, write us the guidelines, write us this, uh, do this, do that as a consultant. And here in Latvia, it was not the consultants that were doing things, it was the actual FIU, the actual prosecutors, the actual supervisors, the actual uh, uh, policemen. Uh, 
I was giving good, good advice. Other consultants might be giving, giving good advice, but it was actually the uh, public sector with the uh, public-private partnerships with the private sector um, that were doing the job. So what are the next steps for Latvia after we've spoken so highly of, of the government and everything that's been done here? Well, first of all, we have to be careful of the winner's curse because you've avoided the gray list, and that could be a winner's curse because the worst thing that can happen is that uh, this topic is, th is thrown away because we need to ensure sustainability, both in the capacity of uh, the authorities and, of course, in uh, the upcoming electing of a professional FIU head. These are all very, very important issues for, for Latvia, and I hope uh, uh, due attention is given to them. Uh, we, I think you need to address your vulnerabilities, both the supervisors and the private sector. For instance, de-risking. I think the situation of pushing out all the high-risk customers is uh, a very bad policy. Uh, if at the end of the day we're going to have all these AML rules applied in banks that have only low-risk customers, so we're going we're, we're to burden the low-risk customers and let the high-risk customers find other platforms, that, that's uh, very, very counterintuitive. We need to focus not only on the financial sector, but also the non-financial sector. Just look at what happened this week. Uh, the Americans uh, listed 13 Cypriot lawyers that were assisting oligarchs. This happened in Liechtenstein as well. In the U.S., the lawyer pled guilty for dealing with Russian oligarchs under the sanctions. So this is beginning to hit lawyers and company service providers beyond the, in Europe, beyond the banking sector. So this is definitely uh, uh, something to, to look at for at, in, in Latvia as well. Um, I think the next the lessons learned, if we, we have to sum up, uh, you have to understand the evolving risks. It's not about uh, complying with, with the recommendations and it's over. We have to look at the new evolving risks, the organized crime. We spoke, we heard today about uh, human trafficking. That's one aspect. Tax, the informal economy, corruption, which we didn't hear, did not hear enough about today. And of course, I think one of the main topics is continued focus on sanction evading. And here, I don't have time to go into this, but I would urge you to treat sanction evading as a risk-based issue and not a rule-based. This is not just about scanning lists. This is about trying to find out on a risk-based approach where the potential sanction evading is. And we need to update the um, anti money laundering effort to the evolving FATF standards because the standards are changing. So we have the new recommendation 24 on beneficial ownership, which is now focusing on public procurement, on foreign companies that are operating in Latvia, um, legal arrangements. There's going to be revisions. We, had, we have a revised methodology, which is putting more, more focus on confiscation, international cooperation. So there are definitely uh, the, 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 the topic is quite misleading. We, these, these, uh, it's not only that these standards are evolving, but that the risks are evolving and the, uh, the, uh, the challenge of achieving effectiveness is becoming harder and harder. Uh, so the last thing you want to do is to feel that you're out of the gray and into the green. It's, uh, it's a constant um, uh, struggle, and I think you today have the capacity that we as a country, both in the public and private sector, and I, I wish you the best of luck in maintaining this capacity and uh, moving ahead, uh, uh, facing the challenges ahead. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Well, the audience is active. We have um, time maybe for two, three very quick questions. But we would not like tricky, to... Not tricky ones, I hope. Well, a uh, few little, mm -hmm. yeah. So um, the first one, it's like a, um, a bold question, but um, based on all what you have seen with Latvia developing, would you say to a potential investor that Latvia is now a safe place to invest? Uh, yes, I think I think any kind, all the jurisdictions that have uh, passed the scrutiny of FATF uh, are become more attractive to investors, and rightly so, because uh, you have much more, much better supervision, much better uh, risk understanding. And yes, the, the 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 short answer is yes to that. This is very counterintuitive, yeah, but it is actual. It is actual fact. And uh, I know there's been COVID, there's been uh, the war, there's been, there's been uh, so much going on that it's, it might be distorting statistics, whatever, but the, the, I'm absolutely sure, I'm absolutely sure, as it, as it did in Israel and in other countries, that uh, once you get out of the stigma of the gray listing and the, the, the fact that you've uh, 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 in, uh, enhanced your transparency, enhanced yep. your supervision level, enhanced your regulation, is something that attracts 
the big stable money of uh, looking for investment. Thumbs up for okay. the encouragement. Okay. <laughs> uh, another one. Uh, so what Latvia should do more to further improve its AML reputation in Europe, rest of the world? I know it's, it's like a big one, but maybe one, one idea. As I said, the two main things I think now are, are, are detrimental are de-risking. Yeah. I think that if you continue pushing out uh, the high-risk customers, uh, they will find alternative uh, ways and that will be much harder to monitor and will create problems and things will explode. So de dealing with de-risking as a vulnerability. And the second is making sure that we actually understand the evolving risks of the topics, some of them we heard this morning, if, whether thanks to sanction evading, whether human trafficking, these are all evolving risks. Do we know where the, the, the money that's involved in the laundering of these risks is actually going through in the, in the Latvian uh, financial system? I'm not sure. This, this, this is exactly the challenge. Yep. And whenever Latvia is going to be evaluated next, this, it will have to demonstrate how it's evaluated these, these risks properly and mitigated them Thank you. properly. And last one, a little bit uh, a challenge. So, based on your uh, understanding of EU, right? So. Should EU introduce its own mutual evaluation process? And the question is if it is really serious about its AML efforts. <laughs> so I, I, I'm not sure there are resources for this. And I think the whole AML effort, actually, one of the problems of it is that there's no, there's no business model of funding all this additional effort. I myself am an advocate of taking the money we take from the confiscation, the money we take from criminals and using it to fund this, uh, the supervision and the, this whole sort of, I think we need to think about a, a more sustainable model of how to, I don't see as somebody that, I don't see a, a way that Europe could, a feasible way that could, could be involved in this. Because but, there is already international framework. Yeah, and, and not only international, but let me, let me criticize the, the FATF for a minute. Okay. Because there is, a, there is one issue which is very uh, problematic, is that the FATF tells us all to apply a risk-based approach. But at the end of the day, the only, a body that does not apply a risk-based approach is FATF. So FATF spent an, the same resource in evaluating Russia as it spent in evaluating San Marino. Mm. Uh, so, uh, of course, we need, to, we need to start evaluating countries on a risk-based approach. High-risk countries should be evaluated more. UK, US, right. Russia. Uh, these countries should be evaluated every year, maybe. Smaller countries, to, to a lesser extent, we have to think, try, why not apply, apply a risk-based approach on the whole thing? So I don't think creating more uh, evaluation bodies is going to solve the problem. I think we need to adopt a risk-based approach in the actual evaluation process, a uh, global one. Thank you very much, Ehuda. Thank you. Give him a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much. You. We continue with the uh, great speeches, and I would like now to introduce you to Mr. Howard Rostron. Howard is um, the head of the Eco Economic Crime Prevention Oversight Lloyds Banking Group and advisory board member at CIFAS. And your presentation will be there to share. Uh, welcome, Howard. Give him a big round of applause. <laughs> Now, my sources tell Howard that this morning you were starring of our key show, Panorama. It was. Really? Okay. Really? For entire 12 minutes entire. on financial crime prevention. Thank you for sharing it with the wider audience. You're welcome. My other sources tell that you usually run 5K each morning. Did you do one this morning? I did. Oh, you I did. I did. In the beautiful parks of Rio. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Howard, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and thank you to the um, Financial Association Latvia, Latvia Association, for inviting me as well today to speak. So um, what I want to do, was, was said there, was talk about dare to share and some very, very exciting things that are happening within the United Kingdom at the moment in relation to legislation. So let's move swiftly on. So if you look at the diagram up here, there's two dichotomies that we have in relation to data. We have economic crime legislation and regulation and data protection regulation and legislation. And there's a couple of boxing gloves that I've included purposely within between those two diagrams because what we do see is conflict between how the regulators that are covering both those areas actually work. 
And the winner of that, generally in my personal view, is the criminal. Because as we, at a regulatory level, are continuing to discuss and debate, the criminals are getting away with potential funds and assets. So this is something that we really need to focus on. And in the UK, there's probably two words that have started to come out over the last, I would say, six to 12 months. The first one is the title of this slide, which is the coalition of the willing. So when we're talking about data, it's bringing willing parties together, people who want to work and people who see the power in data. We've also changed the terminology very slightly, but materially it had quite a big impact on how we propel this, propel this forward. So rather than talking about data sharing, we talk much more extensively now about data collaboration. And you might think, well, it's the same thing, isn't it? But actually the terminology that we use, there are slight differences and nuances between those two. So let me talk then about the five pillars that we've got around what's happening with the legislation um, at the moment within the UK. So we've got two bills that are going through our parliament at the moment. One's called the Economic Crime and Corporate Transparency Bill. And that one talks very much around, as you would think, our economic crime regulation. And the other one is the Data Protection and Digital Information Bill which talks very much about the, um, the data side of change. And what we've done is both those bills now are actually aligning with each other in relation to the terminology and the way they work. So what we've got within here, if we look at the first one here, this first block on criteria, the criteria for data sharing, if these, when these bills go through, changes, that it is now down to a belief that another business holds information that will or may assist you in relation to your economic crime capabilities and improving your economic crime delivery. Or if you feel there's information that you hold that will assist another organization. That is a seismic change from the way that, that we currently regulate in relation to data and economic crime. So a big, big move forward for us. If you look at the second one here then, so legitimate interest has always been quite a challenge in relation to can we share. And quite frequently, organisations would err on the side of caution and say, we cannot necessarily state that we've got a legitimate interest to undertake this data sharing. So what happens between when this legislation moves through is that actually legitimate interest moves to a much more expansive term. So it includes the whole gambit of criminality, which is fraud, economic crime, cybercrime. And quite importantly is there's no balance test required. So ultimately, it provides additional protection to either entities receiving data, but also to entities who are actually passing data. This one here, and we haven't talked about this at all, we've talked about data quite a lot at the conference today, it seems to be a common thread, is civil liability. I work within the private sector, and there's a bigger fear for civil liability prosecution than there is actually for criminal prosecution in relation to data. And for a long time, there's been a mismatch about how organizations are protected from civil liability. And what, again, this change will do is provide organizations from any subsequent civil liability chain, um, claim in relation to any of their data sharing. So quite a change. The other one there that we've got is multi-sector. So this isn't just the premise of financial services. The way that the terminology of the bills are constructed is saying this allows data sharing across sector. I mean, just imagine that you're talking big tech, social media, telecommunications. So quite a difference from what we would have today where those organizations would see the ability to share data is something that they wouldn't be comfortable with due to legal repercussions. And then finally, is the two elements of how we can share. So there's direct or indirect data sharing in the way that the, the legislation will be constructed. So direct is either an ask for information because you've noticed as another organization you think could help with one of your investigations, or for you to tell another organization, I think you've got a problem. 
You're harboring criminals here. So in direct, you've got two elements. On indirect, it's a bit like transaction monitoring Netherlands. So it provides an actual mechanism and a framework for utility-based sharing. So hopefully just from that little bit, you can see why I'm so excited about this. This is a very, very big change for us. But let me try and bring that to life, because that was a lot of words. So what I'm going to do is walk you through this here. So this is just some common data flows. So what you'd see is there's a deposited institution here that's passing money into company one, two, and three that all bank with this bank A here. There's also funds that are coming from a third party account into company one. And then down here, we've got bank C, D, and E that are all paying money into this company three. Right at the end here, we've got an ultimate beneficiary bank that we call company B. So let me give you some groupings. So ignore the transaction flows, but how does this group into common entities and perhaps a network against which you can undertake some sort of economic crime review? So we've got bank A, in effect, is the receiver of a significant amount of funds that are coming from numerous sources. And by this bank being able to draw together the fact that it's receiving its common remitters into depositing accounts, they're able to group these three companies together. Company F probably wouldn't think there's anything wrong at all at this stage because Company F's saying, I'm just sending money into Bank A. So it's just a normal transaction. Down here, we've got these three banks and organizations that are all providing this common funding that's going into company three. So at this stage, these three wouldn't be talking together, but ultimately they're remitting into here. And beneficiary bank B, they may have a view that maybe there's some criminality happening here, but the bank A is definitely the mechanism in the area where the most benefit could be. So let's think about the linkages and how this legislation should, could work. So bank A could do one of two things at this stage. It could say to bank B on the tell scenario that I talked about earlier is we've got three common entities that we're very suspicious of. And we are saying that this is going into a bank to an organization that, you, that banks with you. You need to look into that. So in effect, providing a proactive tell. The other option that they have as Bank A is to go to Bank B and say, we're very suspicious about these three entities. Can you provide us with some more information in which to build a case? The other one then that we've got as well is these three here. So in Bank A providing a view of potential criminality between these three companies, they could have, again, either an ask or tell scenario to Bank C, D, and E. So let's think in this instance, they would go to CDE and say, we feel there's criminality within your books and you need to do something about it. So ultimately, CDE can then start to look more intuitively at company three, whereas at the moment that would mean nothing to them. And the final one on there then is this top line into third party account Bank F. Now that may be actually a valid customer account that's just moving through a money flow into company one. It may be masking other type of things. So there's the ability for that organization as Bank A to share that data. If that was today, none of those data flows and information collaboration would happen. So in effect, what you'd have probably is Bank A might raise some suspicious activity reports send them into the FIU, and then it goes into whatever the further information is. So in utilizing this legislation, there's the ability to identify criminality potentially in five other institutions, which to me has got to be a huge success. So organizationally and as a community within the UK, we're working about up how this will operate. So as it isn't in legislation yet, so we're actually preempting and starting to think about how that could work. But let's look now just as a bit of a roundup about how do you do this? So how has the UK moved from what I would say 10 years ago was a distinct lack of data sharing capability or data collaboration into the will to try and change something? So I think what we've got here, if you look at the pyramid of success, as I would call it, is the first stage is the evolution stage, is providing that mechanism of using the term the coalition of the willing, getting people together who've got the forward vision 
to think what can we do? What can we do to provide a much more stable and a much more impactful economic crime capability within our organization? and undertake tests. So we talk about them like data fusion cells. You might use similar terminology as well. So whether that's anonymizing data, whether that's using a, a much smaller group of either data sets or individuals, start to experiment, start to evidence where the value is. The next one then is, is here on the test, and this is hugely important as well, is outline the benefits in what you're doing. So what, what I've found has been heavily involved in here with our government is you can go to them and say, we really want to share more data. And that's exactly the response you get, silence. It's like, okay, you want to share more data. Tell me why and give me evidence. So build an evidence package, build a compelling case that explains and outlines where the value lies so that you're starting to influence and drive that col um, collaboration between them. The next bit then is the collaborate bit here, so moving into collaboration, is you've got to work collectively. You've got to work against the public and private sector. Within the public sector, you've got to work across law enforcement, government, FIU, different sectors. It's difficult, it takes time, and it takes a lot of disappointment, but also a lot of elation as well, but you've got to find the right people and get together and deliver. Then the agreement point here is, is find the common ground. I think what, what we've looked at through the legislation that I talked about earlier is it isn't perfect. It delivers a lot more. It isn't necessarily exactly what the public sector wanted. It probably isn't exactly what the private sector wanted, but it's brought us together into an agreed position and something that has felt able to go through the government and through the House of Commons and the House of Lords in the UK to gain some form of agreement. And then the final stage is this top pinnacle of your um, pyramid, which is around the legislation. So as it says on there, be prepared to act. The biggest issue that I think we've got now is that the private sector does nothing. So we get all this legislation that we've pushed for, and then we still have issues on, mm, not sure that our legal teams are happy with sharing this data. I'm not sure we know how to make this work. How do I inform that bank? How do I inform this bank? How do I act? So there's a lot of work now around building operating models, principles, and approaches to enable us to act on this when it comes in. So I think if you think about it in those three things, evolve, test, collaborate, agree, and legislate, I don't think you can go far wrong. And if I want to think about the theme of, of this point, is it worth it? So I've been in economic crime prevention for over a decade, and I've been talking about data sharing, data collaboration for at least the length of that 10 years. Is it worth it? The fact that we've got to hear it absolutely is. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Howard, for your inspiring you. speech. Well, yes, there are a couple of questions. Sure. Right, so one of those is uh, we talk about cooperation, right, about sharing. Yeah. But Howard, uh, it's not always that straightforward to get the stakeholders around the table to share, especially in sensitive subjects, uh, you know, who may relate to financial crimes, etc. Yeah. Anything, uh, any, um, you know, recommendations in that respect, how to actually facilitate the sharing? Yeah, so I think to me it all derives around that benefit point. So ultimately, people will act when they see there's a benefit for them or for their organization or their entity. So I think by right. forming a compelling narrative that is fact-based, whether that's through management information or some of the bits that I showed on the pyramid around testing, will bring people to the discussion table. I think as well is know your informal influencers. So within every country, there'll be certain entities that have quite a sway with others. So by focusing on the key par parties, what you'll find is just by attracting those, you can create, in effect, quite a momentum for right. us to get involved. Okay, 
clear. And the other one is um, the, the person asking the question basically says that the AML took the society, at least in Latvia, by surprise, right? Yeah. So it just landed. Today, we talk also about ESG, and AML is a fundamental part of it, of course, but the question is, you know, how to prepare the society like better this time, so it's just not new, um, how, to, how to get them on it? Yeah, so that's, that's one of the things that we have actually talked about, is how do we make consumers understand why we're doing this and the importance of the way that this is acting and, and taking place. So one of the things that we have done as part of the trade association within the UK is started to build up education and awareness campaigns around what this sharing will mean. And in effect, what it could mean to you as a consumer is at times there's more questions right. about your source of funds, where did things come from? But the main pivotal bit we've got now is to plan, gain the approach, provide that education and understanding up front, but also in the education, it's helped them understand that what we're trying to do here is prevent horrendous economic crime mm -hmm. that takes place. So there may be impacts, but ultimately we would see that it's for the societal good. Right, exactly, for the benefit. Not exactly. That. Yes, society, but also your particular business as well benefits from it directly. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Howard, for uh, the reflections. Let's give him a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Our next fantastic speaker is Ms. Guna Paidere. She's Chief State Notary at our company's house. That's for the uh, UK uh, persons, but in Latvia we call it the company's registry. And um, Guna will present a um, topic on the transparent UBO register as an enabler for a prosperous business environment. Because Guna, I know we are lucky to have you as the chief state notary. Under your home, the, uh, the institution isn't, am I right to say that it is based on public opinion, one of the highest regarded uh, state or public institutions in Latvia? Yes. Oh, well, it is, yes. So building trust and, and confidence and respect is, is a big journey. And thank you for doing that. And I think that that is not just because you simply now register, yes, which, what you do, but, but you, it's, it's more. And it's about this, you know, providing the businesses now with an actual um, information in addition to those, you know, mandatorily registrable units, but with a source of information about the beneficiaries, about uh, other key business information which promotes transparency, which promotes business, which promotes confidence and trust. Guna, uh, looking forward to your reflections. Yes, thank you for the nice introduction. Um, today I'm here uh, to talk about UBO register and its role in the business environment. And I will touch upon how it operates in Latvia and the impact it uh, has made uh, uh, so far. Um, I would like to start by introducing the uh, mission of the organization I represent, um, as it uh, sheds light on our approach uh, towards this uh, responsibility and uh, our uh, attitude towards educating the public about uh, this, uh, uh, its importance. Uh, the mission of the Enterprise Register is to collect information to ensure safe and transparent business environment. However, uh, this mission comes with two major challenges. First, uh, the balance between information availability and privacy. And secondly, uh, the need to ensure adequate, accurate and up-to-date information in registries, or in other words, data quality. And what I see from the time uh, when we as a company register uh, became responsible also for uh, collecting beneficial ownership information, 
that we have a cr uh, crucial role in preventing the misuse of uh, legal entities. Uh, as I read in UK's company's house uh, strategy, uh, that company registers uh, become as a first line in the fight against corrupt business practices by providing the transparency and clarity. Uh, by introducing um, beneficial ownership transparency, uh, what I see uh, that the role of company registers in Europe changes and the latest European Commission proposal uh, to amend company law directive shows that data quality issue is important not only uh, in UBO registers, but also in company register. Um, here I want to stress that in Latvia we do not have separate uh, beneficial ownership uh, register. Uh, the uh, enterprise register is responsible for maintaining uh, 13 uh, public registries and uh, responsible for registration of all legal entities in Latvia. And the UBO information is uh, part of the national legal entity registration system. Uh, transparency always has been a very important topic uh, because data on companies and other legal entities uh, has always been publicly available. Uh, and since 2020 uh, are freely available uh, without a fee. Uh, and also, as you see, our development continues. Uh, uh, from, from 2025, we will be responsible for the new register, lobbying register, and it's also, again, about transparency. So in Latvia, uh, we take transparency very seriously. As I already mentioned, uh, the Enterprise Register is responsible for maintaining public registries and you can see that we have a lot of information in one centralized source. Here is the example uh, regarding limited liability company, uh, which is the uh, most popular legal entity type in Latvia. You can see that we have information regarding company, its legal owners, its uh, ultimate beneficiary, and uh, all the ownership or control chain. And uh, uh, data quality is one of the top priorities for us. Uh, we actually check the information before we enter it into the register. In our database, we have not only the data, uh, but also all supporting documentation, including ben uh, beneficial ownership documentation. And our registrars ask questions uh, and additional information if they don't understand the ownership or control chain. And it has been recognized also internationally, uh, according to Global Data Barometer, the Enterprise Register Latvia ranks as the third best registry in the world uh, as regards data availability and uh, uh, reliability. And it's also recognized by our uh, law enforcement authorities. Uh, they use our information uh, in, in, in investigations, and so far it has helped them to do their job. It is challenging to ensure data quality, but uh, we are trying our best to provide good data. Apart from the quality, uh, data quality, it's also, uh, we also have a second challenge, which is the balance between uh, public interest uh, or transparency and safety of business environment and privacy or interest of single person of uh, his or her data protection. And this balance uh, needs to be carefully maintained. And to do so, uh, we have a legal framework uh, uh, where we regulate data amount and uh, availability provisions. How much data do we collect uh, and if all the collected uh, information are publicly available and also we have a specific regulation for uh, open data. And the um, uh, Enterprise Register is responsible for ensuring that the information about the business ownership and transparency um, is uh, available to the public and to maintain uh, the transparency and privacy balance. In the uh, real uh, life, uh, our regulation works, uh, looks like this. 
So we have different uh, access levels to the information. Some data sets are available free of uh, charge and without authentication, and some information only if there is legitimate interest. Of course, law enforcement uh, uh, authorities, uh, they, of course, as usually, have the full access to information, and also we have a specific access to journalists. Uh, it's also al almost full access with uh, uh, some little uh, restrictions. Um, we spent a lot of time to do this analysis, to make this legal framework and to provide services according to it. And uh, after the European Court of Justice ruling, uh, uh, our Ministry of Justice of Latvia uh, has made also uh, additional assessment and announced that we will stay open and we won't change uh, data uh, availability provisions. Still, uh, transparency and safety of uh, business uh, uh, environment prevails. Uh, here you can see um, uh, more practical information because usually when we speak about data availability, then uh, we, uh, different uh, customers have different opinions of what is accessible and what is not. Uh, but actually, in Latvia, we, uh, uh, we provide access to data in different channels. Uh, of course, all the information uh, is in electronic form and mainly is distributed in electronic channels. So we have uh, uh, three channels uh, in uh, electronic form. Uh, it's a specific uh, web portal. Uh, APIs, so the information exchange between uh, IT systems and open data. Uh, all these uh, channels are um, free of charge and uh, uh, the same rules apply for the private and public se sector. So it's no matter if uh, the government institution apply uh, uh, to access this data or uh, company, for example, the same provisions. Uh, we have some services also uh, for a fee, uh, so you can see here the beautiful picture of uh, uh, registered links between companies and persons. And also we do specific data selections if customer uh, asks for it. Uh, still, of course, we have a traditional channel where, where you can uh, ask uh, document copies in paper form and we will prepare it. Um, what, but what is the benefit for the uh, business environment? Uh, entrepreneurs view, view information sharing uh, uh, both as a liability and an asset. Uh, we did a survey uh, and the, the, the conclusion was that uh, uh, our customers uh, perceive uh, submitting information uh, especially on the beneficial ownership uh, as an administrative burden, but they are glad to access the same information about their business partners in public resource without restriction. So it helps businesses uh, in their daily life to lower the risks and understand with whom they are dealing with and uh, uh, doing business with. So far, uh, the situation when we most appreciated uh, that we had a working UBO register uh, with quality data uh, was after the uh, Russian invasion in Ukraine and the application of sanctions. Um, uh, when the EU sanction packages started, uh, there was a demand from the society, from the public, that the state uh, must react quickly and uh, freeze the assets belonging to the sanctioned individuals. Uh, and it was uh, quickly realized uh, that uh, individuals do not own anything, uh, but the legal entities they control, uh, they have assets. Uh, since the enterprise register already had experience in, analy in uh, analysis of ownership uh, and control chains, uh, we took uh, on the centralized role uh, and performed the data analysis uh, of uh, uh, all these uh, uh, ownership and control chains uh, and uh, provided uh, these uh, results of the analysis to other state registries and also uh, 
the result of the analysis uh, or the list of the entities controlled by sanctu uh, sanctioned uh, individuals is publicly available. So it helped act quickly and uh, uh, so from the government side uh, the asset freezing was done very uh, quickly. And uh, this initiative has also grown uh, in into uh, amendments uh, to the regulatory framework, uh, which in the future will give the authority to the enterprise register uh, to enrich registered data uh, with the sanction risk notifications. This in turn will make it easier for entrepreneurs to check their business partners. So to conclude, uh, transparency uh, can help promote a culture of corporate responsibility and accountability, uh, which is essential for a healthy and prosperous business environment. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Guna. Thank you for your leadership. Actually, we have several questions. I will try to um, a little bit put them together in pack them, right? So the first set of questions is about the data quality and access. And the um, conference participants basically, uh, they have noted that obviously some of the information you simply add to the file, right? Some of the information is it actually checked on the substance, right? So that is basically the question, because one of the um, other uh, says that the problem with the UK company's house, it, it doesn't verify the accuracy of the information. So, so the, the, there are actually three questions on the same topic. The, the trustability of the information, is it simply added to the file or you go deeper? And in which instances you go deeper, if, if any? Uh, we go deeper, we do the checks, we do actual checks. Um, uh, we have implemented risk-based approach. Uh, and uh, when we speak about the registration of beneficial ownership information, uh, then uh, uh, it's not just a declaration from the company or other legal entity. Uh, uh, we uh, ask additional questions. We ask supporting documentation, uh, extracts from uh, registries in other countries, passport copies, um, contracts. So uh, our registrar uh, uh, has to understand uh, the ownership or control structure. So we do uh, ask questions and we uh, do it in all the cases, uh, especially in those uh, where we have these complex ownership structures and uh, foreign elements involved. But also we have uh, other uh, additional uh, checks um, uh, broader than just beneficial ownership registration. Uh, they are related with tax, uh, pre preventing tax evasion. So we have a close cooperation with our tax administration. So different kind of uh, uh, elements uh, and tools has been implemented to ensure data quality. And uh, as I was mentioning that uh, now uh, uh, European Commission announced uh, uh, amendments in company law directive and uh, what I see in the text that this uh, the, the same provision as from the AML regulation, uh, the data must be checked before. Uh, the data quality is important. Uh, in this company uh, law uh, uh, directive, it is suggested that registries, company registers uh, must uh, uh, do uh, quality checks before they enter the information in the register. So it, this, the data quality issue becomes more and more important and not uh, only regarding beneficial ownership registration. I am practicing lawyer on daily basis and I know well that is it. And they go deeper and also should not be like um, a problem or a shame if your attitude sometimes changes. Simply, uh, I mean, we all uh, like uh, learn together, right? How to actually, there is no one recipe and this is a challenging thing. So the, the, the best practice through publications, through making uh, aware, so that is, that is how you do it. But it is true that at the beginning, uh, 
Uh, it was not so easy because we were learning and uh, together with the cu uh, our customers and there was a lot of conflicts, but now yeah. after several years, of course, uh, 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 we have more si similar views on how it should be registered. Thank you for that. Um, well, yes, there are many, many questions, but I just want to, you are very much, you know, actually a, a digital uh, believer, right? A, a leader. Companies house in Latvia is already very digital, actually. So, but what are uh, the next steps in your road to digital transformation, the further steps? Yes, uh, currently we are working uh, on uh, automation of the registration. So we want to be the first registry uh, providing uh, 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 very quick registration without involvement of our registrars, but still to keep uh, data uh, quality. So this is currently what we are working for and uh, uh, of course, uh, IT technologies are developing and uh, we can implement more and more sophisticated uh, uh, data checks and uh, uh, maybe not in all cases we need a human to check the information. Okay, thank you. And, and the last one, again, several questions around this, the, the, the known judgment by the European Court, right? So, and, and very, very uh, simply and, and shortly, if possible, will the UBOs still be opened in Latvia for some term? Uh, I believe so, that yes, because uh, recently Ministry of Justice announced that uh, we will stay open. I, I hope that uh, it, it, this decision will stay. And uh, the Ministry of Justice uh, did an uh, additional assessment. Uh, maybe we need some uh, changes or improvements in the law, uh, but we understood that current uh, regulation uh, is uh, enough uh, to provide uh, public access to information. And what, uh, uh, what is the uh, maybe basic reasons uh, is that um, uh, AML is not uh, uh, pre prevention of money laundering is uh, is not the only aim uh, why we have this information in public registry. Currently, uh, sanction application, and I think as uh, business uh, environment transparency uh, also is a very important aim why we need to keep it open. And in Latvia, we have used to the data availability. It, they are uh, available for around uh, 20 years. Uh, now for the last uh, three years they are free of charge. Uh, uh, so, and I, I could imagine what, what would happen if we closed the access because our private sector has already used uh, to use the data and had implemented them in their daily processes. Yeah. The private sector are a little bit hesitant when they themselves need to add their own data to the file, but they are very thankful and actually willing to use the rest of the information. Yes, this is, the, <laughs> that is, this is what we also understood from uh, one of our surveys that uh, I don't want to share my data, but I want to access the same data about my uh, business right. partners. Sharing is daring. Okay, thank you very much, Guna, for your reflections. Very worthwhile. Thank you. All right, we have still two fantastic speakers today. And I would like to welcome on the stage Jan Persson Triggedson, Senior Customer Success Manager and Tier 1 Risk Ambassador at Refinitiv with the presentation Good Practice Regarding PPP, Public-Private Partnerships. And Jan, uh, you were previously head of risk uh, in a group service at a major financial institution. Therefore, you must have real experience to share today regarding the PPPs. And also, um, sources tell that you are appointed as a panel expert on AML by the Egmont Group. Uh, and you are associated with the Global Coalition to Fight Financial Crime. Yes. Looking forward to your reflections. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you Jan. Thank you all for having me today. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Jan Pearson. I am from London Stock Exchange, and I'm here to talk to you about uh, public privacy. Um, today's focus is about sharing information and what the transition we've gone through from Refinitiv 
or LSEC in relation to achieving that with not only at a higher international level, but also with our current clients. Um, when we sort of uh, started out in the beginning of 2018 and 2019, we saw that there was a requirement from a strategic level in relation to establishing uh, sort of PPPs. In that way, we had some strong uh, leading factors within our organization who started out in relation to creating the global coalition uh, in relation to trying to bring together Europol, uh, Interpol, and other financial institutions along with other regulators, and creating that build up in relation to uh, creating a public-private partnership in relation to creating an awareness and focus on uh, AML and CTF. The focus is also, of course, in relation to all the uh, offensive within that space, and uh, we heard a lot about modern slavery today uh, and, and human trafficking, and also in relation to how that fills in. Um, we recently then also joined the uh, South African Integrated Task Force, where we are helping facilitating uh, with data in relation to creating reports and seeing the patterns of human trafficking with a lot of focus on that. All this is very strategic, and we've gone through the process of trying to sort of establish that uh, over the last five to ten years. Uh, what we've also learned is um, when I go out now and I meet clients uh, throughout EMEA in relation to major clients, whenever I meet the, the head of a financial crime uh, department and I ask him or her, are you part of a PPP, PPP uh, association, etc., the answer is normally no. It's usually at a higher level that they join these committees and they get the input. So there was a huge demand for sharing of knowledge and, and getting that confirmation more. Um, we can see on the operational level, we were very much in relation to increasing communication with our clients on risk legislation, solution trends, specific areas, peer groups. What people normally come in, in relation to, to attending is conferences. That's where they get most input, both on, train, on trends and legislation. They're also in relation to, to webinars and all that. That's kind of where we had, had the feedback. So today is not about talking about the deliveries from London Stock Exchange in relation to world check and products and solutions and what we do within risk, etc. It's more about the more added value we see it, we're driving with our clients in relation to making sure they get to communicate internally among each other. Now, just covering off the, the first uh, aspect, the global coalition fight uh, against uh, financial crime uh, was created in 2018 and is a very strategic level. It is a organization now or a, a PVP that facilitates a lot of, um, uh, how do you say, um, task force units or groups uh, assignments and they deliver a lot of papers and replies to whenever parliament comes out with new legislation. It is very strategic and, and it's very driven by thought leaders and what we've seen throughout the entire uh, community in, in, in general. That's also uh, what we like to see in relation to where we as an organization would like to be. That's what I need to bring to clients as well. I need to know what's going on when I talk to clients uh, in relation to uh, what are the trends and what are they thinking. So that is my connection in order to make sure that I stay connected with, with the coalition and what I'm hearing from them and what's driving from that. Now that's not what every uh, compliance officer has time to do. Even the head of compliance sometimes don't have time to do that. And that's where we saw a gap from our organization in relation to the clients that we have who are just mainly focused on, on working within our, of course, uh, solutions that the conversation were not being had at a tactical level. Uh, and that goes throughout the entire of, of, of the mirror. So the concept here was to build up some sort of a solution uh, in order to focus on that. I'll cover more on the uh, uh, tier one risk client engagement model, and that's basically the aspect of what we're doing in order to make sure that we not bring not only PPP into a strategic level, but also more of the tactical level, to make sure everybody gets included. And actually something you can take home with you today in relation to start exercising uh, by tomorrow. Um, we also have the, um, the South African uh, Milit, where we have, as I mentioned before, uh, focused a lot in relation to trying to deliver data. London Stock Exchange is, well, of course, a massive provider on data, and we have a lot in relation to the understanding and trafficking 
uh, of what we've seen uh, based on money and following the money around uh, EMEA, as well as what we're seeing from a concept of human trafficking. All that is, of course, something that's driven and used to help identify inherent risk for our clients, as well as understanding then potentially how that fits into the risk assessment profile in general. But it also helps us in relation to generating different kinds of reports that we can use and share with clients in order to help them potentially start or support their risk assessment with the inherent risk understanding. And that's what we see in relation to a lot, in relation to uh, having conversations with the clients. That's in relation to the strategic targets. Now moving into what we've seen from a tactical point of view. I was given the option to sort of figure out how to roll out the tier one risk model in relation to engaging with our client. My first point was to establish uh, quarterly meetings with my clients uh, without, throughout the year. I generated a report for us to revisit once a quarter. The idea here was for me not first to to add comments from me as to as from coming from LSEC, etc., as to what we saw from regulation changes as well as what we saw from trends. But the idea was also to once I had a conversation with a client about what they saw as trends and what they saw coming legislation-wise, to ask them if I was allowed to add that to the template, to add that to the list. They usually agree to allow me to do that anonymously, and I then bring that in to next quarter's report that is then shown to all the tier one clients. So now London Stock Exchange becomes a facilitator or mediator of communicating between each of our clients anonymously as to what they're seeing for changes and what they're seeing of challenges and legal changes. And all of a sudden I have all my clients without having to join a webinar, without having taken too much time out of the schedule, being able to communicate and understand where everybody thinks things are going, either trend rise or legislation wise. And again, these are uh, senior management people, um, head of uh, financial uh, crime units, etc. Those who are just about close enough, but not all the way up where they would join the coalition. They have a huge hunger for information as well. They need to know what the trends are because they are sitting in operation. We're talking about the first line of defense that needs to know what's happening, not in six months or 12 months, that's a nice to know half. That's actually something we cover too, but they need to know what the trends are. What is the bank next, next door telling them what to do? The challenge here actually came from when I was uh, head of risk in uh, group services, where I found that I had more communication with the regulators than I actually had with the next door bank. And that, of course, is the feeding into the PPP concept, right? Where we join forces between us, in this case, as a solution, uh, provider compared to the client as well as the regulators. I use my contacts and exp experience with the regulators to add from my point of view, as you can see here, clarifying power to AMLA. I think that is a higher topic. Uh, we heard that earlier today from the beginning of the session, the new uh, text coming out. Uh, end of March, I think it was 28th of March, it actually came out with all these new features. Uh, and we're seeing that the any money laundering authority is going to get a lot more uh, power, I will go as far as saying, with that 500,000 to 2 million pound, uh, 200, 2 million euro fine, they start all of a sudden getting an issue based on irregulatory, no. Uh, let's say discrepancies in the policies, uh, or however you want to sort of uh, element that, or how you want to lift that. We saw that uh, there is a virtual asset contract group, which uh, is also very interesting. Uh, there was a huge financial institution asking me to go out and find out what others were doing in virtual currency screening. And that's also part of the report now that we do on a quarterly basis. So I have taken some of their points down as to what they're doing, and I'm showing it in Q2 to all my tier one clients as to adding to that contact. Come Q3, that slide will be updated and shared amongst all of them so they get a feeling about what are everybody doing in cryptocurrency screening and what makes sense and where they're going. So that is the kind of communication I, as a provider of a solution, can do because I have access not only to the regulators but the entire portfolio of my clients. I don't have to wait for a webinar. I'm very happy for being allowed to join here today or on the conference because I got a lot of new ideas.
specifically on trends, I think will add on the human trafficking, what's actually being done uh, by each. Do they feel comfortable that they're all covering that aspect? Uh, I think we'll, I'll add that up here. I will uh, quote <laughs> the conference as the source, uh, and I'll see how that progresses throughout Q2 and Q3. The same as uh, we saw in relation to data sharing, we just saw the presentation on data. You have to find the right people in this audience, and that's also what I've spent time doing within these different kinds of uh, organization, making sure that the people who's joining my business view meetings are the same audience, so they get the same feedback based on that. As you can see, we saw UBO regulation. We just heard a great presentation on that. Uh, that's going to be interesting. Uh, that's already in scope for a lot of my clients with that 50% ownership, 15% uh, ownership plus one share, and then 5% for high risk country. I'm not gonna say there's a panic spreading, but they are all looking to see how that goes verifying and how that goes forward in relation to regulation and what happens with that. And there are already questions as to, will that potentially spill into the sanction space? And what will that have of in, in meaning for indirect sanctions potentially going forward? And then we have the money laundry environment uh, for environmental crime. It is a focus area, but there, it's, it's, normally never, it's normally never really brought to a lot of attention. But there's a lot of money going in there right now in relation to AML. And, uh, and the financial institutions are a lot of focused on, on cryptocurrency and UBOs and a lot of other elements. Uh, so it's kind of been agreed with the, with, the, uh, with the tier ones that I will be keeping it in relation to trends and legislations to make sure that we keep focus on that going forward because at one point in time, there's going to be some additional action to it and right now they are sort of contemplating at least using that in the inherent risk on the risk assessment part uh, in relation to saying if you have an industry that is sitting in relation to environmental uh, uh, industries like locking in Brazil or uh, having uh, locations in Africa and doing um, some sort of a wildlife a legal uh, company approach, then that's also covered. As I mentioned in the beginning, uh, we also have created peer groups now. Um, so the, the latest part of that is actually making sure that um, uh, I've communicated to a lot of the clients as relations to if they want to meet each other. I get a lot of positive feedback from that. I need to make sure that it's the right people again that meets each other. So there's a lot in relation to who sits in transaction services, who sits in name screen, etc. But there's a lot of interest between the clients to actually sit down in a group, especially on a tactical level, and having those conversations and sharing ideas. But it never really happens or materializes because somebody has to sort of run with that. Uh, and it's just too much for one financial institution to start bringing in for others to sort of have that ongoing. As London Stock Exchange and as they are my clients, I have the opportunity to run with that uh, project on their behalf. It creates transparency and credibility towards London Stock Exchange and me as well. So it's not, uh, as you said, it's not without benefit for us from LSEC uh, because it does create a, some really in-depth conversation as to um, what, uh, what are we seeing and where do our solution needs to go. So, I get a lot of voice of the customer feedback that I can feed back into production, I can feed it back into development, and I can say, this is what the client's saying, this is where we need to go. You need to develop WorldCheck to go that way. That way we can meet the requirements in six months, in 12 months. And that's what they want us to do. So it increases the conversation. So I can only encourage people sort of to say, okay, fair enough, uh, um, reach out potentially to your, to your vendor or provider, and then ask them if there are opportunities in this space to sort of have them uh, run with something like this, uh, because it is definitely adding value to the conversation. And um, it is good for everybody in financial institution as well as corporate to meet your counterparts in this space, because it takes everyone to, to fight against modern slavery and human trafficking. And I am going to stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jan, for your reflections. Well, there is a question uh, on, um, yes, well, these private-public partnerships have challenges. How to ensure that the best practice and good governance is observed like equally by all participants, right, of yeah. the 
of the um, cooperation. Yeah. I think the, 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 the challenge has always been in relation to communication. Whenever I have a, uh, so, so for instance, the, the peer groups is based on clients. Once we agree on what is the challenge, we can invite, we had the FATF coming in talking about uh, transaction screening. The moment they step in, the moment the regulator steps into a room with clients, I can feel tension, right? There is yeah. going to be tension because there's going to be things said that they have no issues telling me, but I can see it's not getting brought up and it's not my place to bring things up. Um, so there are still that, uh, uh, that, that uh, element of, of figuring out how to still trust each other, specifically in relations to on, on an international stage, I would say. I really think that the reason why uh, Latvia have been able to sort of achieve what they've done so far is because it is a community. It is a lot stronger community uh, than where if you on uh, in relations to all of EMEA tries to bring trying to bring everything together. That is, that will take time, uh, and I think uh, even though we are rushing it, uh, I can see that if I look at what has changed from 2003 to 2017 uh, for the third money laundering directive, there was not a lot of attention. But after 2017. Uh, the last six to seven years, I've never seen so much legislation or so much urgency or so much activity. And I keep seeing it continuing right now. So I believe that that sort of uh, public-private partnership will start to merge more and more, and you will have more of an adjustment between uh, who says right. what and who, who brings what to the table. And Thank you'll have you. more balance. Clear. Okay. Round of applause for Jan. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> right, we are approaching the, like the closing, the summary stages of our conference, but we have excellent speaker. We, uh, I would like to ask on the stage Uldis Upanirks, who is Citadel Bank Chief Compliance Officer and member of the management board, whose presentation not just is it worth it, but like was it worth it? Does the compliance with AML, CFT regulations and tools address the necessity for sustainable development? I know all this, you are a real practitioner, right? And this is, you know, a lot of issues lay on your table on daily basis. So, um, and I know that you have yourself facilitated very much to this effort of complying with all the 40 recommendations that we have been discussing today. So your uh, reflections would be invaluable in view of like a summary, right? So uh, very much looking forward all this to your presentation. Okay, thank you. Okay, hello everyone. All the greetings to one the ones who made till the till the very end. It's a matter of sustainability. If you're sustainable, then you can make it to the end. If not, if you are bad in time planning and you have a conflicting meetings during this very nice conference, then unfortunately we don't see you. But anyways, a uh, lot of lessons learned and uh, over the last, I think, five, five, seven years. And it's very hard to summarize it in a cup. I mean, to cover all the changes or all the takeaways in a. 14 minutes and 30 seconds, so I will focus on a couple of them. The first of all, I think the overarching question by Maris was, uh, was uh, whether it was worth it. Uh, since we are now in, what, 2023, and if we look at activities that we have done starting 2017, 2018, from perspective 2023, absolutely yes. By all means, first of all, because we are still here, there are still banks that exist, and there are some banks who doesn't exist anymore comparing where we, where we were back in 2017. And that is the S component to the, to the ISG, which means if you are not compliant, you are unsustainable, which means you will be sooner or later out of the business. The big question mark is whether you are for a business for a long term, and then of course it's kind of fine. You make as much money as you can in one year's time, leave a mess after you make some money and run. Whether it's sustainable, absolutely not, and it's all about, let's say, company's culture, it's all about governance, it's all about shareholders, it's all about tone from the top, etc., etc. However, for example, if we have not been starting the substantial de-risking of the whatever remaining flows from the CIS countries back in 2017-2018, I'm absolutely sure 
that February of 2022 would be even more bigger disaster than it than it was uh, in, in, like like well, like we faced. Because from sanctions perspective, if account for those clients from the CIS that has been de-risked and until now, we would certainly not be able to manage the the first of all the sanctions compliance. Secondly, if we go for a huge de-risking at once because of the sanctions, because of limitations on the balance of the account for Russian citizens without residence permits in EU, etc., etc., that would be, I mean, big, big ice bucket challenge, the big cold shower, and I think that there will be limited, limited number of survivors. What's the lesson learned? The lesson learned is that for many things that you are doing, the results will not be immediate. Which means if you start to do something right, you will see results of your, act your actions, not next day, not, not, in, not, not in a month's time, and that all depends on the, on the subject matter. Like one of the previous speakers mentioned, for example, if you gain extra 30 kilos, it uh, takes some time to get rid of it, and then you have to kind of maintain it. But okay, 30 kilos, maybe it's a bit of a, too excessive, but you can drop something in a rather short time. If you talk about ISG, about environment, you're not talking uh, months, we're talking, the, I think, decades. Because if, for example, I start to sort my garbage, you know, it's going to contribute in a longer, in longer future. The same is most, uh, quite many things about the AML and quite many things about compliance and sanctions, etc., etc. Today and every day when we work, we put certain foundations on certain things that will contribute in the future with no immediate effect. And this is usual, the usual dilemma in between effectiveness and efficiency is that uh, and usual, this usual question from the folks at the, I don't know, CFO positions is why do you want these funds, why do you want to spend for this, and that's a bit of the challenge to convince that this is for us, for a better future. There will be a payback, and it's not going to be immediate. That's learning one. Second learning, I think Latvia is, Latvians are in generally shy. What does that mean? We do a lot, but we don't market this as, as, pro as, 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 as properly as we would like to or as we would have to, which means thanks for this uh, great conference, thanks to organizers, thanks for the Finance Latvia Association for putting us in the front and being as able to tell the story what we have done. And when referring back to okay, what we have achieved as a Latvia, or basically from grey to green, it's all about us as an entire country fixing the things, which means it's not about just the banking sector, it's not about the regulators, it's not about FIU, it's not about the law enforcement, it's not about fintechs, etc., etc. That's the joint effort, and that's proportionate effort, and that's cooperation. And in respect of the cooperation, the development over the last, I would say, five, seven years has been dramatic in respect of the how well financial institutions cooperate with FIU in sense of the getting feedback on SAR quality, exchanging typologies, calling up for a PPP meetings to, fac to facilitate law enforcement uh, actions, which is really great. And this indicates one more thing, is that we were at some years ago kind of isolated players in a sense that banks by themselves, regulators by themselves, law enforcement by themselves. Now we finally understand that to achieve the common goal, we have to cooperate. And one of the important things for the cooperation is a trust. And, and now, at least what I feel from practical point of view is that law enforcement finally sees us not as the crooks or supporters to the crooks, but as the decent market players who are on the same side of the barricades with the law enforcement in the fight against the financial crime. And, uh, and also to the sanctions and others are all, all, all the wrong, wrongdoers. So this has changed, but once again, this is the ongoing process. We shouldn't be stopping, we should, we should develop it. Another thing which is also important to mention is that uh, we will never stop in a sense that we have to improve. Also because of the fact that the environment is changing around of us and standards are changing. Uh, one of the my colleagues from one other financial institution usually tells this joke that uh, because we are almost the same age, I can speak also in, because it applies also to me as well. When we were kids some many years ago, myself and my parents were traveling to Ukraine. I was sitting in the back of the car. There was no seat belt, no nothing. Nowadays, I cannot pull out my car out of the garage uh, without kids sitting in uh, child seats and, fast, and with the fastened seat belts. 
which means the standards are changing and those standards and requirements, they will be evolving, which means even, the, even taking into account that the client base for financial institutions in Latvia has changed from risk profile point of view, at the same time requirements are increasing, expectations, what do we do with this additional data from the enterprise register so far and so far, this data is coming more bigger and expectations for achievements or things that we have to do is increasing. And here comes the, I think, the last and most critical dilemma, uh, which, again, we can, uh, we can, let's say, acknowledge that a dilemma exists, and it's Oliver, actually, who, who said it first. So I'll be simply reflecting to the Oliver in a sense of the house with a hundred doors. And let's assume that, for example, financial institution is a gatekeeper of the one door. Then we have 99 other doors. And, and can you imagine that these uh, other 99 doors, okay, you guard those one door, those, the doors that you are responsible for, and there is what, an, uh, another 99. And those criminals can choose your door, which is kind of secure, they can choose one of those 99. But the trick is that these other 99, actually way more than 99, and they are located in different jurisdictions. Those are located in uh, different industries. And overall success of the keeping the house safe implies for synchronization, not just within one financial organization or doing a good work at one financial organization, but also doing a good work in other financial organizations, in other countries, in other industries. And what really sometimes hurts is that you find a criminal, you file a SAR, you terminate a count relationship, and you hope that this is a clear indication to that villain that, okay, this cannot happen anymore, shut down the leg legitimate business and please behave. What's actually happening, they're shifting. That's the reason why I hope this sound line, this, this, this will, will help and improve. But once again, many of the investments or many activities that we start to do, AMLA is one of the great examples, is going to be something that will not give immediate fruits. It will take some five, maybe seven, maybe ten years in the future while we will get, we'll, we'll see the touchable results. But until then, I believe that we have to work together and we have to synchronize our, synchronize our activities. Another example could be, uh, I can make as effective and efficient the SAR filing system and file as many SARs as I can, or I believe that where I have to file the SARS, but they also know that, for example, there is FIU who is processing those SARS, and there are law enforcement who are supposed to be working on the cases. And if I'm filing more SARS than FIU is able to, um, to handle, and law enforcement, the law enforcement to prosecute, I have to find the balance. And this big uncertain question is, how shall, we, how shall we act? Shall I stop, or shall I decrease my activities and look for other folks uh, in the team to pick up with the, with, the, with, the, with the pace, or I shall run in the pace I want to, or I can, or I have to, or I believe I have to, and whatever happens with those two, it's, it's, it's beyond my control. That's, I think, one of the dilemma, but I think the same dilemma exists in all other countries, and there are people who are thinking on this as we speak on how to, how, how, how to address this. And last but not least, I would say that, yes, we are working for a higher good, and that is at least what, what should be the ideology and mentality of the compliance people. Same time, yes, we have a regulator, we have regulations, we have to comply, and again, risk-based approach versus rules-based approach, both in, uh, in attitude of financial institutions against their clients, but also an attitude from uh, regulators towards the, 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 the industry. Because once again, we are not here for ticking boxes, neither financial institutions in a in the process uh, of compliance that financial institutions are executing, and I also believe that neither also regulator is involved and is willing to just go ticking the box approach rather than, than looking on this subst uh, by, by, by substance. And uh, what is also my honest belief is that the regulators should cooperate and work together with the market participants to make sure that we understand each other, we consult each other. I think in Latvia it's a really, really good uh, example of this cooperation which has resulted in this uh, guidelines uh, how on the client due diligence and enhanced due diligence, which is not a regulation developed by uh, Bank of Latvia, former FCMC, it's neither something which is developed by just industry, but it's a joint work on explaining, on bringing uh, good, exam good, good examples in place. 
And of course, this of course facilitates, but again, this is not a savior. There is more and more and more work to be done because like I said, the environment is changing, criminals are changing, expectations are changing, and uh, basically our work is a movement, is, is, a, is a, I would say, moving target, which always will be, will be moving. There is little what we can do about it, simply run. Yes, and it's also what's important, it's a mental strength, mental strength for compliance people, which has been developed over the time because it's a stressful job. You're all the time audited by everyone and everybody. Uh, if you fail that you are getting penalized and it gives another stress and I think we have built a nice resilience for sake of sustainability to make sure that we can run the business and execute upon our duties. Yes, uh, knowing that I'm the last speaker and it's myself between you and my, yes, you and the end of the, end of the conference, Maris. I have saved two minutes, which is unusual for me, I usually take two, usually I'm 10 to over speaker. <laughs> So that is fantastic achievement for a lawyer. <laughs> yeah, <thank you>. <laughs> <laughs> well, all this that was fantastic summary. I think you all basically did already, you know, three quarters of my job in, in, in like giving, giving, uh, giving the, the, but still, you know, the people are interested, you know, all has been done and it's all good, but what about, what do you think all these are the next steps for Latvia to ensure continuous sustainable development and compliance with AML, CFT regulations? You know, not to have this uh, problem like, uh, like Yehuda said, the problem of the champion, right? Who kind of lays back, enjoys, and then suddenly finds that again he is, you know, leaping back. No, I think I even know it myself that I, if I would be, let's say, asked, okay, what could you do on the top of the things that you're already doing, I could take, I don't know, a long, 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 long sheet of paper and yeah. write, it, write it in a small text of things that yeah. I believe we can, we, can, we, can, we can do more. That's, once again, that's a balance yeah. because, um, like I said, if we are, we are in a situation where we are de-risking somebody because we believe that uh, the risk is too high or client is dubious. The trick is the, 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 the fact that the client can go to other jurisdiction and continue, it's not the kind of solution in a sense, which means I can fight as much as I can, there will be, won't, won't be a result, so we have to balance this, uh, this, this, uh, this exercise out. And I think that compliance people are usually the ones who tend to overdo rather than to underdo. It's also, once again, the long time uh, established approach to the way of living in a sense, it's better safe than sorry. Folks at the, at the business side, they sometimes tend to think other other way around, and it's the, the usual challenge and usual dilemma. I wouldn't say the usual fight, but it's a usual kind of discussion which brings to the balanced solution. Yeah, excellent response. Round of applause for all this. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, you have been a fantastic audience, and it's so rewarding to see still so, so many of you present. I will just try to summarize it up in a very, I would say, simple and hopefully short. Uh, as I said, many of the speakers already did most of that. But it's always good to a little bit reflect um, on a good day, and the day was really good. So the day started with, we basically, we defined uh, we had this interesting, very interesting discussion, you know, ESG, AML, sanctions compliance. And I think the key takeaway is that they supplement each other, right? They do not cancel out each other. The ESG is not some kind of a new concept for AML and compliance. It firmly stays in place, but ESG is the future. It is wider and obviously ESG connects with the businesses in a way that I think it was in your panel discussion that show the businesses the business, right? Turn compliance into business. Right, it is not so easy, but I think that is the spirit. 
and it is so important for our governments, our public authorities, to continue this dialogue, but also uh, invest into alignment, into understanding, into identification of the businesses. The financial sector has definitely got it right, but we were so important to tackle those small and medium enterprises, the businesses in general, with the uh, idea, the concept of compliance, the concept of uh, strict observance of the sanctions of the AML. The small businesses do not need to do like everything what a bank does, and nobody expects it, but it is into their best sustainable interests to do that. I think that was a, a, a clear message across the panels, across the speakers today. But at the same time, the state should continue funding and resourcing the law enforcement. It was in the, uh, in the reflections of uh, Oliver, Yehuda, and other speakers that it is so important for the state to continue both enhancing the professionalism and giving the resources to the police, to the FIU, to the prosecutor's office, to the court system, to basically be this watchdog and enforce to ensure a level play field in our economy, which definitely then has this impact of attracting more quality investment and more trust into our financial system, but basically the business in general. So I think that was also a strong message. Continue, do not stop increasing the capacity of our law enforcement. We also discussed the social dimension of the um, of, of all the, uh, let's say, the, we, we tackled the human trafficking issues in the light of the migration crisis. Um, we heard from the chairwoman of the Independent Association of the Banks of Ukraine about the experience of Ukrainian banks, and we saw how resilient their banking sector actually is in the times of war. That is a fantastic achievement. We also heard from the European Banking Authority about the best practices for banks in reacting to the migration crisis. And we heard um, from the EBA uh, representative, Amandine, that uh, it is not just putting forward policies, but it is uh, following up with the implementation clarification for better adoption. And I think it is also so important in financial sectors work with your clients. I mean, this, this interaction, you know, streamlined uh, approaches, some kind of, you know, industry uh, leadership uh, and industry alignment for which the Finance Latvia Association is a wonderful base. And it has proven like this, the, the, the AML handbook developed together with the regulator is, an, uh, is a fantastic example of that uh, stewardship activity. But if we talk about ESG, there is still even much more stewardship activity needed by the clients, by the sector to actually engage and to follow and to comply. Um, we also discussed uh, about sanctions compliance and the link to governance. It was clear message that good governance practices, really, uh, let's say, sufficient independence on supervisory board level, professionalism on the management board level, who uh, are taking the interests of the company at the forefront. Uh, interests of the company coincide with the interests of the shareholders because they are normally aligned. But the interests of a compliant company is the best guidance for a management board member, supervisory board member to pursue. And uh, uh, obviously, uh, we also talked about uh, digital developments, digital transformation. We heard inspiring speeches from um, from uh, 
you know, many, many market participants, especially proud, I think I'm personally proud. I think we all are proud of our company's house, of our enterprise register achievements. So, uh, and, and uh, very good all this for your summary. I will not repeat any of that. I think uh, it was a fantastic day today at the conference. And um, in closing, I would like to, uh, big, I think, you know, for the Finance Latvia Association, it has been a great success for you. But as it happens, sometimes uh, the, the people, the real who are working in the, in behind the scenes, like who actually prepare it, they were not on the stage today. But I want to extreme sincere thanks, you know, to uh, Finance Latvia Association team, Laima, right? Sabine. I mean, it's, uh, you have invested so much uh, into it. All the, all the deep white uh, excellent professionals, the, the promotion um, company, the, the technical staff there. I think they made our today's experience a whole one, a whole one. Uh, obviously about the chefs, you, they were mentioned uh, more than once today and you will have the final opportunity to uh, basically uh, still have some follow-on discussions about today's results, about next steps planning at a glass of wine, which I really uh, suggest you go and enjoy. And I'm told that last but not least, you can get a 50% discount on your parking fee if you apply to the, to the uh, reception desk counter. So take good use uh, of that. With that, I really want to thank the Finance Latvia Association first and foremost. I think it was a valuable celebration of your 30 years sustainable operation achievement and I would like to close this conference. Thank you very much. You are a fantastic audience. Thank you.